<laughs> All righty. Good morning. It's Monday, November 7th, 2022. It's 9 a.m. We're in the city chambers, and I call the city commission workshop meeting to order. Commissioner presents are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner White, Mayor Emrich, Vice Mayor Langdon, and Commissioner Luke. There is a quorum present for this meeting. Also present, we have City Manager Fletcher, Deputy City Attorney Golan, Assistant City Clerk Gianelli, and City Clerk Faust, is it? You, since you changed the name, and Chief uh, Titus is in the back. And I call on City Manager to do the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> you got any public comment down there, City Clerk? Yeah. All right. We have item number 22-3606, City Manager. That's your item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 22-3606 uh, is the discussion of possible direction regarding City of Northport federal and state legislative priorities. Uh, as a reminder for this item, we did discuss it with the commission back on September 13th, and there were some motions that were passed regarding how we would proceed with our priorities. A uh, motion was passed in order to remove uh, economic development support for the DEO and Visit Florida, remove hospital districts um, supported taxes, and add an affordable housing blurb, add the Suncoast Technical College funding blurb, and update statistics as it goes to the card that we pass out, as well as adding recommendations for Medicaid and the COCPN program. Uh, we are working on the statistics and the form in order to make sure that it is updated. Um, Mr. Miles, you might want to come down and join us. Um, the two questions or two items we want to raise up are one, the affordable housing blur. We're trying to get some clear direction on what you would like added to it other than just support of affordable housing. It's kind of broad the way that it is or the way that we think of it. But if there was something more specific that we wanted to add, we would definitely seek that direction. Uh, otherwise, um, we can still support affordable housing knowing that there just may be different um, avenues that we seek for support. As it relates to the Suncoast Technical College, um, the question that we had was regarded to the owner of the funding, and we know that Sarasota County Schools is doing the same thing, but we do recommend um, adding something to the effect of support the fully funding of the SEC to ensure their facility and growing student population needs are met. Um, that might be a little wordy, you might wanna um, pare it down. And also we have uh, legislative, state legislative priorities um, to remove the Northport home, port home rule and remove FEMA disaster reimbursement and update the statistics as well, which is underway. So um, let me just repeat that, Mr. Mayor. The direction that we're looking for is on the STC. And if language stating that we support the fully funding of STC to ensure their facility and growing student population needs are met, uh, as well as um, the the home rule removal on the state, and we should be good to go from there. All right, I have some questions. Commissioner Luke. I believe the removal of home rule needs to be from the federal instead of the state. Um, right. Home rule is a, a state thing, so I am definitely in favor of removing it from the federal legislative priorities. Uh, definitely want to see the STC added. I think the wording that city manager said is adequate. Uh, I think it has to really say anything different. That was what we were after. And as far as uh, affordable housing, I don't mind it personally being broad <laughs> so that we can jump on anything. If you get specific, too specific, you might not uh, get the point across. And we are at a point where we had a full list of lots of things that staff is going to be bringing back to us. Um, it's quite lengthy, and I don't know. I would just personally, myself, I don't mind naming all of those, but I think just keeping it broad kind of helps us. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, I agree with the STC funding. And as far as affordable housing, maybe it could be something as simple as uh, supports all initiatives 
and incentives to bring affordable housing to communities um, in light of Hurricane Ian, because this discussion was prior to Hurricane Ian, um, maybe there needs to be something added that um, addresses insurance reform, tort reform, which is the legal parts, um, the assignment of benefits. I know that this is stuff that um, I'm almost 99.9% .9 sure the state legislature is going to be addressing this legislative session, um, but adding it as a priority mm -hmm. might help it along to tell them, hey, we do support this because we were one of the largely affected areas. Um, the warm middle springs, if we're looking for ways to kind of shorten things up, maybe that's an area we can shorten it up. I'm not saying to delete it, but it is quite wordy. Maybe it can be condensed in some fashion. Um, and I don't know if maybe Chief Titus has an update regarding the emergency medical transportation, if that's still necessary. Um, in light of everything else. So those are my thoughts. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Commissioner White. Yes, uh, the affordable housing I, uh, that needs to stay in there, but um, would like to maybe have a discussion about having that be more specific as far as what funding maybe we're talking about. There was a lot of talk last year about the Sadowski um, funding not being used for what it was supposed to be used and um, just in general well I hate to use the word general because I <laughs> what I'm saying is I like to be more specific um, what we're talking about because last year you know looking at this again it's very broad and it doesn't really pinpoint anything and I think if you're um, I'm thinking about you know, process writing, what's your main idea? Well, it's, we, you know, we really had a concern about not having the funding that's already been established being used for what it's supposed to be used for. So uh, just a thought out there, maybe that should be specifically uh, mentioned. That's it, thank you. You have anything to add to that, sir, on what you've come back with? Sure, uh, Todd Miles, legislative analyst. Um, Hopefully you all received the memo on affordable housing that I had sent some time ago, free storm. And um, what I was hoping to do for you in sending that was review the last couple of years of legislative enactments in Tallahassee and affordable housing. So you can see that there's been quite a bit of activity in Tallahassee on that subject. Um, from folks I've talked to, they're I'm not sure there are any indications of any specific focus on it this year because of all this recent activity. So I thought that it would be helpful for you to see what's been done, um, particularly regarding authorizing municipalities to approve affordable housing projects on almost any kind of zone property in the city um, in hopes that you might want to um, perhaps be more specific in terms of what kinds of things, what kinds of initiatives, what kinds of funding you'd be looking to support now. Um, I'm not sure whether that this is consistent with you know your your view of it, but I just wanted to try and focus you know on specific affordable housing initiatives. Um, otherwise, um, I think the other items on here, nothing's really changed regarding emergency medical transportation. That's pretty stable. Um, I can certainly consolidate the language regarding the springs. I think some of that wordiness is really stating the reason for what we're asking for, but it can be consolidated down just to clearly um, refer to the fact that this legislation is what you're after in order to get that designation as an outstanding Florida Spring and, and whatever flows from that. Um, do we have a, a timeline for actually finalizing the language for this? Because I know it has to be transmitted to various parties in Tallahassee and taken with us. So what, what's our goal here? I think the first timeline was given by the county, which we needed, we sort of flow up through. And that was all pre-storm. So I would say now we really need to get this sort of done like today <laughs> and get it out of our hands and into their hands. I'm pretty sure they're waiting on us, but they probably haven't waited on us. They probably have moved on if they've had to, but we can catch up. But we need to make some decisions mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Do we know when the delegation is for the county? 
I did not know that. Yeah. Commissioner McDowell. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, as the representative um, for Minnesota League of Cities, I need to have it probably by Thursday's meeting. Um, we are going to be discussing the legislative priorities, even if we have a kind of a draft. Um, they do need it to prepare for the delegation meeting, which I believe is in January this year. So, okay, so basically, there's your timeline. Hmm. There you go. So has it been the practice to actually have the actual language finalized at the commission meeting? So there's really no opportunity to follow up for clarifying it. But we, when we walk out of here today, it'll be the final language that's in the documents. My goal. That's my I don't know about the my fellow commissioners. Yeah. Okay. The final language today, and that way, then it, it doesn't have. To, I don't need the fanciness of a rack card printed to to submit it to Minnesota League of Cities. But I do need the finalized language. Okay. You know, it pretty much has all the nuts and bolts in it. And that's going to be the final product. So do you want to entertain some motions? Your lights on. Specific language in it? Yeah. As far as uh, the War Mineral Springs, I think just asking for the legislation for it to be so you could strike the rest of it. But um, I believe the STC was not picked up. So I would like to see that added with the wording to that. And so if we that finalizes those two, um, we need to figure out about affordable housing, how we want to go about that. Well, what would be the wording for STS? Can we maybe agree on exactly what you want to say? I believe city manager spoke it. Now, I'll so say it again well, just to make sure no one wants to edit it. But I said support the fully funding of STC to ensure their facility and growing student population needs are met. You say it one more time, please. Support the fully funding of STC to ensure their facility and growing student population needs are met. <laughs> I would spell out or say what STC is because the problem is is they're not funding the technical colleges the way they should. Yeah, sorry about that. It's Uncle Stan. You want to make a motion, Commissioner? Workshop. Workshop. Oh, that's right. Damn it. How are we going to word affordable housing? I, I heard two things. One, Leave it broad and one leave it specific. I'm I'm in favor of leaving it broad to be I, able to attack all angles. So if we just take a consensus here. Well, and and I'll what I'll say is you could leave it broad and be more specific. The broad and says, I think I heard supports all initiatives and incentives. That leaves it kind of broad, but it's said more than just supports affordable housing. Right. That might be your compromise. I'm good with that. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah. Uh, affordable housing supports all initiatives and in incentives. I think it's pretty much says it all. Commissioner White? <laughs> uh, I, again, I'd like to see this be more specific. What are we talking about? This has been in here, uh, affordable housing, and have we gotten anything? Give us an idea then what you're looking for. Well, I, I mentioned that specific fund um, that when we talk about affordable housing and having these funds available, and then you're talking about your email with the rezoning and using funding, well, what, what sources are we really looking at? And that Sadowski fund has been in the news a lot of not being utilized for what it should be. Well, maybe we could work into the phrasing um, support for all initiatives and incentives to encourage affordable housing, including appropriate use of Sadowski funding okay. as a state Perfect. resource. That, that sounds kind of good. Yeah, thank you. Together. Thank you for coming up with those words. <laughs> yes. if, if there's any funding left, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree. And I think I also am concerned about the misuse of the I always want to say Sadowski, <laughs> but, um, and, and I think we really need to 
encourage the legislature to use that money for what it is intended and not other purposes. So um, I agree with the funding, with the uh, wording suggested. Commissioner Luke. Yeah, I think that's an excellent um, answer to that. It leaves it broad enough, it takes in all funding, but then brings up the Sadowski fund. If uh, they're bragging they have so much money you know, left over in reserves, they need to be spending the Sadowski fund for what it was intended mm -hmm. for for the past, what, 20 years, something right. like that. They, they, don't, they don't ever get it right. Fair. Commissioner Mendel. Yeah. You said the appropriate use of Sadowski funds. Is that what your suggested wording was? Yes. I would like to, instead of appropriate, because it all depends on who you ask, everybody you ask has a different idea of what would be appropriate. I think intended and. use of the of Sadowski funds because the voters voted on yes. that intended use, that it be used for um, Sadowski funds. So if we could change it to intended use of mm -hmm. Sadowski funds, I think would be um, more accurate. Excellent point, because yeah. they feel as though they have the right to cut Exactly. It's it. appropriate to put it in the general fund. Right. <laughs> Did Can we you say intended use as expressed in the voter Voters, approval? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to suggest that. That's really good. Thank you, Commissioner, for bringing that up. Approved by voters? As approved by voters. Was there any other ones that you needed uh, clarification on? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the federal is pretty straightforward. Um, were there any nuances as a result of Hurricane Ian in, under infrastructure or any of these items? Anything you want to tweak here at all? Because I recognize that this was all expressing the discussion pre-storm. So I think that might come under federal because FEMA is federal. I don't know. Well, it could be federal. It could be state DOT for transportation. Although. I mean, arguably, some of the things that were in here are the same needs. It's just they become more acute as a result of the experience. But I um, just want to make sure that you've perhaps considered it in light of the storm and its consequences in the city. Well, we haven't really gone through all of the consequences yet. We're still finding out avenues as we go along. So to name those right now might be premature into the fact to where as we go through the storm, find out other things that we may want to prioritize in the future on how things may or may not have been handled with you know the after the storm you could make a, a title of disaster recovery and then have mm -hmm. uh, something after that uh, looking for aid help finances grants whatever you know under disaster recovery ironically we're probably going to know something more about that subject after the next stage of this workshop because you do have some state folks here who will be talking about what resources will be available to address the needs here. So if we still have an opportunity, are we, we're going to bring this back to a meeting for an actual vote? These, the, the, these yeah. priorities? because this is a workshop, so you're not... It is, but I don't think they need to vote on them. I think we were finishing the language today, okay. if I understand correctly. Yeah, didn't we vote on them and now we're just tweaking the language? Right. So I think the disaster recovery is a good opportunity to make carry sure a lot of things in a lot of buckets. Can I make a suggestion there? Sure. Can we, and help me with the wording, can we table this to re-examine it after we have the uh, 10 o'clock discussion that's going to include the FEMA and other representatives for economic development and disaster recovery. Instead of trying to finalize it out now, we might hear things that we go, we need to make that a priority. Can we just kind of wait until the end and come back? Yes, you can. Is it is it table it or? It is table it. OK. Uh, I'd like to get a consensus, Mayor, if we could uh, table this to um, after the economic development um, recovery discussion. All right, and that would be 
which item be uh, 22-3668. Yes. Okay. So there's a consensus on the floor to table item number 22-3606 until after the 22-3668 discussion. Uh, Commissioner McDowell? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. And Commissioner Luke? Yes. All right. So we'll table this until <clears throat> after that discussion, and then we'll come back and revisit it at that point. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to 22-3423, uh, City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this item is discussion and possible direction on partnership policy uh, for events. Um, Director, Parks and Rec Director Sandy Funheller is joining us, but as she does, just a quick reminder that uh, in January of 2021, there was an event that the city partnered with uh, through the Kiwanis for a marriage vow renewal event, and then we had another event in 2022 with the Kiwanis that was a Say I Do event, and <coughs> It ultimately led to a discussion about a policy that would allow us to implement consistency as we choose these events. I personally know that there's a lot more nonprofits or volunteer groups that would love to partner with the city on various events and having this kind of structure revolving around it would create for a better outcome. But I'll turn it over to Director Funheller and she'll provide some introduction to the event. Thank you. Good morning. Sandy Funheller, Parks and Recreation Director. So for review today and in response to the continued interest from the community organizations, which the city manager has referenced, um, we've developed a partnership policy. Uh, it's to provide a uniform standard and procedure for evaluation and administration of partnerships with Northport-based individuals, businesses, and nonprofit entities whose missions and services align with the city of Northport mission and values. Uh, staff will follow an interactive and transparent process that will treat requests fairly and responsibly, and that starts with the completion of a partnership application. Each application will be evaluated based on the following measures. Uh, first, that it aligns with the city's mission and it supports one or more of the city's strategic priorities. It has an identifiable or specific public purpose. It provides an unmet service or benefit to the city residents at large. It does not duplicate or compete with an existing city event, result in direct costs being offset through event participant fees and charges, and result in net revenue being equally shared between the city and the partner. Applicants will be required to provide some background information for the organizer, a detailed description of the event, resources anticipated or required, and disclosure of the financial impact for the entire event. The submittal process is planned to occur between January 15th and March 15th to coincide with the city's budget process. However, if applications are received outside that timeline, we could still consider those based upon available funds. Should the city decide to accept a partnership application, staff would work with that partner to develop an event agreement similar to the Say I Do event that came forward to commission, and then that would be subject to commission review and approval. The partnership policy has been reviewed by the city attorney's office and staff is prepared to implement pending feedback from commission today. And with that, I can answer questions. Commissioner Luke. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm looking at the partnership policy and under definitions, it says event, a city event activity program or city owned property that is available for partnership. How can an event be property. Well, that's that's the definition that we're giving it. The reason we're doing that is because, for example, we had a request that came in from uh, Holly's Hope to use the Garden of Five Senses for uh, a memorial event. And so in, in that instance, that would be a partnership where someone would want to be using a property of, of the city. Yeah, but it still is the property for the event. The property isn't an event. I, I would have to defer to the city attorney um, that's reviewed this. Um, if, if it needs to change, um, we could we can certainly do that if, if they're And as I read through, I saw no reference to property mm -hmm. being an event, you know, throughout this. So um, 
but might that be a memorial being placed on the property on a permanent type thing to where the property would be used? Is that what they're trying to do? It, it I don't know. It could be. It's it's really for for example when Holly's Hope came forward and wanted to have a, a service at um, the Garden of Five Senses, and we didn't really have a way to partner on that um, under our current parameters. They they could rent the park if they wanted to, but if they wanted to do a partnership, um, it wasn't really for use of the property on, on our end. So this is trying to cover all the bases that could potentially be asked for when someone wants to partner with the city. Well, then that would go hand in hand with the say I do again at the Garden of Five Cents because they wanted to use that over there. So that's the language that you'd be using to incorporate all of those. Correct. I still, I, I'm not done. Okay. I still question that. Uh, it's very unclear how property can be an event. If our portion of the event is the use of the property, I think that can be clarified in some other manner. But I do not see an event being a piece of property. If I may, I'm, I'm wondering if that is a typo. That's what I, I mean, thought it was. Than, or it's on. Property. That's so exactly what I thought it was. Someone wants to do that makes far more. That makes property. far more sense. And that's what I had on mine is is a typo. It's not a typo. <clears throat> no. If you'd like me to chime in, I, I'd be happy to. You're looking at a city event, so something that someone's bringing to us would not be a city event, but they want to use our property. I'm sure, we can clean up something in there to make that more clear. Um, if that if that becomes a problem, and changing the or to an on <laughs> clarifies so that, wouldn't fix, that wouldn't fix the problem with it being it's because it's still not a city event until we partner and then it's a joint event, right? Correct, but it it we don't have the partnership. So I, I wouldn't for change it to on city property because if someone comes forward with a uh, suggestion for an event and they actually want to hold it somewhere else, but they still want the city's participation. It might not necessarily be on city property, but I, I'm happy to work with city attorney's office on that language. Please do so. Yeah. It's very, very unclear, and it's not even utilized throughout the, the document. Uh, at the highlighted part down at the bottom of the first page, absolutely love that first sentence. So thank you very much. My question of it is, is each of these applications coming to the commission? No. So the applications would come into city staff, um, and, and we would, all the information, the application was attached, so we'd be looking for all that information for us to evaluate um, if it meets the guidelines that we've set up. If it does and we want to move forward, we would then um, develop an event agreement similar to what you've seen with the Say I Do Again event, and we'd bring that agreement forward for commission review and approval. Okay, so each of them that passes through you guys does have to have an agreement signed by the commission. Yes. It could be put on a consent agenda or something. Okay, thank you. And then on the final question that I have um, under B, uh, the required information for the partnership, uh, it's not stating that it has to be a 501c3 or a nonprofit or a 501c6. Is that because we will also partner with businesses? Correct. Okay, thank you. I'm finished. Thank you, sir. Commissioner <coughs> McDowell. Yeah, um, on the policy itself, I thought the or wasn't on. Um, I look forward to seeing how that can be cleaned up because a city event activity program on city owned property that is available for partnership. If it's on private property, why are we getting involved in that? I, I'm trying to understand that part. Well, that would be part of that application process to evaluate what it is they're asking the city to partner on. So I, I, I don't have an example for you, but if somebody came forward and wanted the city's partnership, Maybe they want to do it on school district property, but they want the city's involvement. We want that. We want some parameter that allows us to evaluate what has come forward, because right now we don't have anything in place to do that. 
Um, because if, if somebody wanted to use the Garden of Five Senses for their event that we are not partnering, then they rent it. Correct. So that's irrelevant to this. Okay. Um, you, I would like to see like 250 attendees are anticipated or 500 attendees are, are anticipated. Having these really small, teeny tiny events that we're partnering, it, how much revenue would they really receive? Um, at, I think the, the Say I Do Again was, I don't know, $75 to the city, $75 to Kiwanis. That seems like an awful lot of work for a very small return. So if we're gonna do something like this, I think it needs to be for the larger events, not these little events. Um, and that's my thought. And I, I look forward to having that conversation. Um, but 200 or 500 minimum, I think is, is, is fair. If we're gonna be spending all this time putting things in a budget and having staff review, they need to be for these large events. Um, the city will review partnership applications within 14 days of receipt. That does not seem like a very long amount of time. <laughs> We're, we're, we've looked at it and we feel that we are capable of doing that. So that's 14 days. When you get an application, then you're going to schedule a meeting with the applicant to make sure it fits the criteria? Well, we're going to schedule a meeting with them to discuss their, their application and what they're looking to do. Okay. It, it needs to be a, um, we all need to be on the same page. In, in bringing a partnership forward. And that gives us the opportunity to flush it out a little bit more and understand um, what the benefit is um, that will be coming to the city and the community. Okay, so that 14 days is not including the commission's review and... It, commission does not review the application. Commission would review it once staff determined that it met all the guidelines and right. we develop an agreement. It's, it's a process. We'd have to develop that agreement. It have okay. to be... Um, reviewed by city attorney's office, and then we would bring it to commission. All right. The applicant in that very bolded part, the applicant in furtherance of fundraising activities, I thought this was the whole purpose of us being a partner, was to help them fundraise. And, and no, it is not to help them fundraise. So if we're, if we're charging a fee for it, the money is coming from the fees that are charged for the event. Okay. So that, that's in here. We've, we've identified that, that we are looking for something where there is some sort of fee or charge that, that's going for the event, and then we're covering our costs, we're covering the organization's costs, and then we're splitting whatever's remained. Thank you. Um, so if you go to see where it talks about application deadlines, the city will expect, accept applications from January 15th through March 15th. But then you have applications submitted outside will be considered. Why? If we have to have it in the budget, if we have to have um, it in the budget, staff has to review it, we have to draft an agreement, and commission has to approve it. Why would we put this um, additional caveat that then makes it, well, if you don't submit it, we'll consider it anyways? Well, we're certainly trying to be flexible with, with groups that come forward and want to partner with the city. I, I don't know that everybody would necessarily know what they're doing um, in January or March, or the idea comes up after that for whatever reason, whatever initiated it. Um, so we're trying to be flexible in that, yes, this is the timeline we want to follow. This is the best time to do it because we can include it in our budget request, but it comes after that and we have the funds available. Maybe something was canceled or um, didn't cost as much, and we can identify that, and it's something we feel is important for the city to pursue, then we would bring that forward. But it would follow the same process. It would need the same approvals. Okay. Um, the application on letter E under criteria, direct costs, is that including labor for staff and the nonprofit or business? Is that including labor time and benefits? 
I'm sorry, where are you looking? E under the application. The very first page criteria E says result in direct cost being offset. Are you asking it's in, including ours? Is From direct the, cost, yes. is that including yes. our staff's labor? Yes, it is. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, Um, so supporting documents attached as applicable, and I think Commissioner Luke touched on that, the nonprofit part. Is this only for nonprofits or is this businesses too? Because nonprofits are registered with some biz. Individuals, businesses, nonprofits. Okay, so if it so if in, it's an individual they're not a nonprofit, they're not a business, how, how will we get supporting documents? What, what would be their supporting documents? I, I don't have those exactly until I meet with whatever group it is. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe an individual is coming forward and is going to work with some other organizations. I, I don't know. We're just trying to cover all our bases and be able to ask for documentation that will help us make a decision. I'm kind of leery about having an individual partner with the city. I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around an example of something like that. So I'll yield the floor for now, Mayor. Thank you. Commissioner White. Yes, um, I, I kind of will pick up where Commissioner McDowell left off with the, the if they're a nonprofit, they have to have a 501c3. Is that That's, they just can't say we're a nonprofit group, we're getting together, this is our group. When they're, but they have to be. So not every nonprofit is a 501c3. Um, so we were not requiring that. If that's something that commission wants to require, we can. <clears throat> oh, okay. Um, because that just gives them more, I think, validity that they really are a, mm -hmm. a, a 501c3. They, you're, you're registered with SunBiz automatically. You have your tax exempt status. It's the whole kit and caboodle. Um, and having just, yeah, a person come forward, I, I would think that we want to limit our liability on that. And then someone who's an established 501c3 or um, what is the chamber? They're not a, they're not a, they are, yes, that at least they're established. They have documentation and you know they're a legitimate group. So I think that should be in there because this, the way I read this, it doesn't, it says supporting documents, but it doesn't say anything is really required. But I would think that should be required, that we have legitimate groups coming forward if we're going to use, if they're going to want to use city property. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and then, is this only for an actual event? Um, does this, can this also be for like an activity such as and I know I've talked about this before, like having hikes. And I know that the Parks and Rec has partnered with the Nature Conservancy to have um, walks in, in the park and things like that. That's not really an event. It's like such as when we're talking about an event, we're talking about paying money and a big, big to do. But if you're just saying, hey, let's lead a hike, let's lead a kayak excursion, it, would that be the same thing? No, we would be looking for events under this there, there's other ways to address things like you're you're um, referencing oh there is we have something in place well we that. have a instructor agreement so if somebody wants to come in and teach something um uh, you know through the parks and recreation department it can be done through an instructor agreement and it doesn't necessarily have to involve um a fee being charged or a payment out it's the the agreement is for instructing providing that service if you're not charging a fee and you're not expecting to get paid, it still can be done under the same agreement. Oh, okay. Because um, that that's where I was always want, thought that there was something missing in, in the city, that 
you know, when I've led kayak excursions, you're saying I would have to put in an application as an instructor, even though I, we don't charge anything. We just we just say we're meeting here. That would fall under that agreement, just with no charge. If, if that's how we set up the the program. Uh, what program? This? If you wanted to do an, a, a kayak instruction program that we're advertising as a city of Northport program, and you're a contracted instructor, um, you're coming to us with the proposal, you're coming to us with the fee that you're charging, okay. and what you're charging the participants and what we're paying you. Okay. All right. So, again, I just want to be to clarify, because people have been talking to me about this. You did uh, the, that nature group, Barbara Lockhart's group, they did the 5K run. Was that in that instructor in agreement? No, or? That's, a, that's an event that they're doing. Uh, they go through the special event permit process. So that is an event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um. <coughs> there were no fees that were shared. There were no revenues that were dispersed. <clears throat> it was an event that they did. They did the special assistance um, program. Right. So that's separate. But it was, it was a fundraiser for them, though, right? They ran for... It, it, it may have been, but it went. It had to go through the special event permit process okay. and okay. get the permit in order to have that event. Okay. All right. Um, so would this then um, cover something like, I was at Newcomer's Day on, on Saturday and had a discussion with someone who wanted to know about why don't we have like these guitar jams that they have in other areas? Why don't we have that on City Center Green? If a group came before you and said, hey, we want to just have a guitar jam once a week at City Center Green. And I told them, well, first of all, they can just do that because it's a park. They can just gather there without this. But if they wanted to have this be something connected with the city, like we're doing this, that would be under this, or that would be under what you're talking about um, just coming before you? Um, so that's a good example, <laughs> but it's also a good example of what you just said you didn't want regarding an individual being able to come and take advantage of the policy. Right. I really think that you should consider not sort of taking it out of okay. an individual's hand because if I'm yes. an individual and I want to do something that's good for the city and, right. you know, give whatever money is, maybe I want to donate it all to the city. That's part of what I want to do. You're taking that away. If, if you limit it to just, um, you know, the nonprofit <clears throat> organization, I think we said 501c3. Right. And there's also organizations which are 501c19, which are veterans groups. Do you want to take right. them out of it? There's also uh, 501c4s, which are social welfare organizations. You, do you want to take them out of it? So right. it really boils down to the individual um, vetting of the actual okay. event that's being proposed for a decision that should be made before it gets to you to say, yes, it's right or it's right. Okay. I just want to know what the boundaries were because I know at Dallas White there was, I don't know if they still are out there, they were having a drum circle for a while. The, the people just spontaneously gather and were permitted to do that. We're, we can assemble in our own parks. I just wanted to know if people do that, would this be something? And you just answered that question. No, this is not something that would interfere with people having the ability to do that. Um, and yes, I, uh, having... I appreciate you bringing up the fact that some of these events could be on private property, such as the Freedom Fest used to be at the Northport High School. That was that was uh, the school board's property, and that limited to what um, vendors were able to be there because it was we had to follow the school's policy. So that, that's one example of how private property um, can be utilized. And but what are the ramifications of that? Um, <coughs> Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Langdon. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, just a, a few thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm always supportive of not being too restrictive of these things, so I wouldn't want to require a certain type of designation um, in order for people to be able to play. And um, I I'm comfortable with individuals being able to come to the city. I'm wondering what people do today if they want to have a wedding <laughs> or if they might want to have a memorial service um, on city property in, in one of the parks and maybe want the city to help promote it or something like that. So um, I'd like to see less 
specific restrictions um, and, and give the judgment to staff to sort of evaluate the relative merits or benefits of helping someone with that event um, for the community. Um, in terms of small versus large financial return, this might sound funny coming from me, <laughs> but in, in this arena, I don't see the benefit of these events being strictly in terms of financial return to the city. I've been schooled by our parks and, and rec staff pretty effectively over the past couple years. And, and we need to think also in terms of community involvement and um, enhancing quality of life. So if we view an event <clears throat> strictly in terms of its financial merit, we might preclude the city participating with an organization that's not charging anything. But, but that activity really might do a lot in terms of community spirit and community involvement. So, so again, less is more, I think, in, in this arena, in, in my opinion, when we're talking about these kinds of activities and events. Um, a, a question, why, why do these come to the commission? for approval? Is it because it's a contract? Um, well, because in general, they are asking for either city resources mm -hmm. or funding from the city for something that was not planned or budgeted. Okay. So in that case, um, if, you know, if we don't have it available or it's a resource, the city is, is not supposed to be extending those resources on a, you know, as a matter of practice um, for other events. So this comes to commission and um, we get approval if if you're on board with that. Yeah. Um, we have a referendum on Tuesday that might um, preclude our having to review these. Um, my experience with it to date is these are at three and four hundred dollar investments um, on the part of the city and, and really isn't something, and again, in my opinion, that this should be on our agenda. But if we have a you know, a, a good policy where the intention is clear, then it's really something that staff should be able to um, review and approve. But um, that's my feeling on it, but we'll have, you know, more direction from the community after Tuesday's referendum. So um, that's it for me. Commissioner Luke. I'm very similar to what Vice Mayor just stated. Uh, I don't think there should be a a limit to large versus small or anything. This is supposed to be a benefit to the quality of life for the citizens and it's supposed to be ideas and things that isn't being done by the city or anybody else. So um, most of those start out small anyhow. So I have no problem with that. Uh, listening to the discussion, do they have to charge a fee? I mean, so that's the only people you'll partner with is when there's a fee being charged or will you partner with somebody for an event that is free? It, it would depend on the logistics of what they're proposing. If, if there was a lot of staff resources, city resources required to partner with them, we would look for a fee to be charged to, to cover it. Uh, okay. That, that cost. It makes sense because we have other avenues for special events and, you know, the payment for that and, your contract services agreement and stuff. So uh, this is just another avenue I see for the city to be involved and have an inclusiveness with the uh, individuals, businesses and such um, for events, activities and programs as it's stated in the definition. Thank you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. Um, using my understanding of the, the purpose of all of this was the Kiwanis and the um, marriage vow thing that they wanted to do. And it was an opportunity for them to partner with the city. They could make some money and the city could make some money and, and everybody's costs would be offset. If this is expanding beyond that to include free events, why wouldn't, what would be the 
need to partner with the city for free events when the nonprofit can already do a free event and the city already does free events. So there's still a cost. If a nonprofit wants to come in and, and hold an event on city property, there is a cost for the use of that city property. There's a cost for uh, recycling and garbage totes. There's a cost for police presence. Um, as the event gets bigger, th there's more costs associated with it. But they can also take advantage of the assistance program that we have adopted that's to correct. offset and those costs. That's there's no staff time involved with putting on the event. All there would still be staff time involved. If, if we have to, when someone rents a facility, there's staff time involved. When someone has an event on our property, there is staff time involved. We're still monitoring what's happening on our property. We're still communicating with them to make sure that they are all set for their event. Do they need any resources? Do they have questions? Um, so there is staff time involved. It might not be, I have to assign a staff person to their event, but there's staff time and administrative time that's involved. City manager, okay. you wanted to say something? Uh, yes, thank you. I was just going to say the, the, the purpose of the policy is not the Kiwanis events. Those are examples of what the policy would be applicable for. And when you do these kind of events, the goal is not for a monetary outcome. It's for the, the, the expanded amount of opportunities for quality of life events just to happen. So if it were an event that, you know, we didn't make any money, but yet we were able to impact 50 individuals who were able to come in and do something that they ordinarily wouldn't be able to do, or that group says, hey, we can't do it without you, then we're actually providing that bridge to the event and to the community. That's better in alignment with our values and what we're trying to achieve. Then these, these events are never going to move the monetary needle of the city in our budget <coughs> or revenues in any way, shape, or form. Can I pick on can I pick on Commissioner White and her event with your permission, Commissioner? What event is that? The the um, tour to Northport. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So tour to Northport was an event that People for Trees did 100 percent all the time for the past I don't know decade or more. Twelve years. Yeah, twelve years. <laughs> all right. So the city basically just accepted the special event permit, processed that permit, and that was pretty much the end of their um, involvement unless she needed the police resources and the, the solid waste pickup, which she and her event uh, coordinators paid for themselves until we established this special event um, assistance program. Then she could apply for that assistance. But those costs were generally on her event prior to the special event assistance program, correct? Okay. That would be correct. So if she wanted to do something to partner with the city, what is the benefit of partnering with the city if she can use the special event assistance to offset those costs. The city still advertises it on the website because she's going through the special event assistance program. Staff is not involved with volunteering, volunteering, I use that term loosely, staff's time to help with her event unless you guys were partnering and that's what we're doing today. I'm, I'm seeing an overlap here and I'm trying to avoid that. If we're going to partner, in my opinion, it's staff is spending time preparing and getting ready for the event and volunteering for that event, just like the People for Trees volunteered for the event, too. And it's like a 50-50. Is that, am I understanding the gist of this as being a 50-50 partnership where our employees are working the event, volunteering for the event, doing things for the event, so that way then there is possibly a monetary 50-50 um, split or possibly no monetary 50-50 split. I, 
I believe that the the intention of the program is not to be a always a 50-50 split. We're not looking to partner just to absorb some of the expenses that they would normally occur, whether it was through the program you mentioned, the special event program, or if they did it themselves. But when you do partner with the city, there are things, you know, such as, you know, like as you referenced the advertising, such as um, director has mentioned the staffing that comes with our ability to be able to assist the uh, event organizer that they would not necessarily incur. The goal is not to overlap anything with the special event program, but we're trying to provide another pathway so that we can be a better partner to these various nonprofits, these various organizations or individuals, so that we can increase the variety of opportunities for the citizens. Thank you. Commissioner White. Yes, so I just, uh, this, this program is because of that, uh, say I do again, that was a whole new, a new, um, but that was a new territory that the group wanted to do this in the city and the city did not have that kind of a, of an event. So, and that's why we were kind of floundering there how, how it was going to work because we didn't have anything established. This would establish the parameters for people coming in wanting to have an event that you don't already have in place, but adding to the offerings of the city. That's how I'm understanding that, right. and that's and that's fine. And I, I do like the the parameters that have been put up there. Um, but I, I'm and I guess this is maybe for a different another discussion, and that's what I want to clarify with you that if. You have other communities have nonprofits that actually do put on like the programming for certain things within that municipality or even the county, and it's considered to be almost like the county advertises it or city of Punta Gorda advertises it, but then you find out it's the it's a nonprofit that that puts it on. For example, because I know I'm not making myself clear here, there the power plant, our electric power plant, is in Fort Myers, and there's something called the Manatee Park down there. and because the manatees because of the water that comes out of the power plant it's warm and you can see the manatees gather there's a nonprofit group I think they're called the friends of the manatees or something they're the ones who put on the tours so when I did field trips down there they're the ones I had to to, to contact to arrange for volunteers to come out and give the tour using Lee County's park there this does not address something like that Right. This is meant for individuals, businesses, or organizations that want to bring a new event to the city that we don't already offer, uh, that right. we've not planned for in the budget. And this gives us the opportunity to consider it, evaluate it, and bring it forward for whatever the impact right. is going to be on um, staff, labor, resources, um, commitment of funds. So that we don't have to just say, no, we can't do that. We didn't budget for it, or it comes see us next year right. for the budget process, okay. and we can talk about adding that in. Um, we don't want to turn people away. We want right. to have that opportunity to increase the offerings that, that we are providing to the community. Okay. And then if there was an opportunity, if a group wanted to come in and do, like we were talking about before, lead a kayak excursion, you said there's already a process in place that that could be done. If it's instructing or providing a, a service, a class like that, yes, we already have a, a structure in place for that. Okay. All right. And that, that includes outings, just an outing. I guess you can con consider that instruction, but just to have an outing, just to go kayaking on the Mayakahatchee Creek, you're saying that would fall under that, what that we have in place? That or would is be that, a program, we yes. have, Do we have to think about having something else? No, that would be a program. That would be, okay. All right, thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. And basically, this is just phase one of the process of getting everything going on a new project or partnership if it comes into the city. Mm -hmm. Correct. Is there anything you need from us on going forward? Because I think you did a fabulous job yeah. putting it together. Thank you. In my opinion, but I'm going to query the, the commission. But I, I think it was good as, as the way you put it. So, Commissioner McDowell? I'm just curious. What's the next step? Is this... After this workshop, what happens next? 
So uh, this would be um, an administrative policy. This is something that the city manager um, puts into motion, um, and then we would, um, you know, advertise it, let people know that it's that it's there, it's available, um, and and move forward. And and I I like the whole idea and the concept. I just don't want our staff time partnering and doing things for thirty people or fifty people. I really think this should be something for larger events. That's just my opinion. Commissioner White? I'm good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I'm comfortable with the policy of the plan. Commissioner Luke? Uh, I, I like the policy. I would just like to see them massage the definition of event where, where it's talking about property. That's, that's the only thing I, I would change. Thank you. And I know that Commissioner McDowell had brought up the point of limiting it or having it for bigger uh, attendances and yeah, stuff like I, that. I suggested 250 to 500 be the right. minimum. In my opinion, I, I don't want it limited, Commissioner White. I don't want to see it limited. I, I, yeah. Vice Mayor? I don't want that limited. No. Okay. So we have the consensus up here with no limitations and the policy as it is and uh, with what Commissioner Luke had put in there. So. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, City Manager, I know we have this next one coming up at shortly after 10. About how long is the process going to be? The process, like their entire duration, it'll be at least uh, over two hours. Uh, if we, 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 let me rephrase that. We've allowed for it to go from probably 10 until one, but if it gets done before then, we were expecting a good amount of input and questions from the audience. So that really will dictate the flow of it. Their presentation, I think it's 20 minutes long. And once then, we'll have a conversation, including yourselves and the others. And that's fine, because what I'd like to do is take a 10-minute break now as they come in and set up and <laughs> yes. everything. And then we can go ahead and, and start from that point out at, I believe, 10, 10, 15. That sounds like a great idea. And then that's why we can have a health break and uh, go from there and take it all the way up to lunch or whatever the case may be at that point. Yes, sir. <coughs> All right, we are adjourned till 10.15.
All right, we're back in session. It's 10:15. Everybody's still here. Um, item number 22-3668, City Manager. This is your item. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 3668 uh, to be heard at 10 a.m. or shortly thereafter. Discussion of possible direction regarding economic recovery following Hurricane Ian with Greg Day of the Economic Development Administration and overall review of the EDA. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for being here today. We do have a lot of stakeholders in the audience, so we appreciate you coming to Northport for this important conversation. Previously, our Economic Development Division invited Mr. Greg Bidet, um, the Economic Development Representative at the U.S. Um, Economic Development Administration to Northport to discuss the funding which is provided through the EDA for their myriad of purposes. Uh, since the hurricane and it devastated our region, overwhelming our infrastructure, leveling homes and businesses, displacing our region's workforce. Um, this disaster vastly changed the needs and dynamics of this originally conceived workshop. So the city is honored to host this economic recovery and resiliency workshop to our regional partners and federal, state, and agency representatives. Thank you for being here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mel Thomas, our Economic Development Division Manager for introductions and facilitation of the remainder of this agenda item. All right. Well, we're going to be moving down to the front row. Thank you, sir. And thank you, ma'am. Trying to get my Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, and I welcome all of our very honored guests today. My name is Mel Thomas. I'm Manager of Economic Development for the City of Northport. We're glad you could join us, of course, and I'm happy for all of the faces we haven't seen in a while. COVID and a myriad of other things have kept us from meeting in person for a long time. On behalf of the City of Northport, I'd like to say welcome, a really deep-hearted welcome. And to our government businesses and nonprofits and emergency management partners um, from Sarasota, Manatee, and Charlotte counties, you are especially welcome to visit with us today. Um, it is obvious that this group of people are special not only to our federal government and to the state, because you have been their invitation list. This wasn't, this didn't come from the mind of Mel Thomas <coughs> to bring you all here. This was mastermind by Greg Vidae, who you'll be hearing from very shortly. The federal and state agency representatives, most of which have traveled a long distance today to be with you, are here to guide and assist, and this is just the beginning of the conversations. The purpose of the workshop is to begin a critical discussion in our region, including Manatee, Sarasota, Charlotte, and all the, munis all the municipalities within, uh, to discuss long-term disaster recovery and resistance project planning and to make vital connections with the federal and state agencies that will be working with our region to provide expertise and funding resources to ensure economic recovery and resiliency, thereby restoring the foundation for regional economic development. We want to build upon an economic development and an economic environment free from the dangers of flooding. This is necessary for our region to attract and retain businesses and the customer base to support them. I would like to take the time now to introduce and turn it over, turn this program over to Mr. Greg Viday, the Economic Development Representative at the U.S. Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration, the EDA. Greg has brought with him today recovery support function, that's the RSF agency. These are all representatives who are designed by nature to help us solve our problems. He'll be introducing those people and giving us a presentation of the EDA's role in disaster recovery. Greg, I'm glad to turn this over to you. So you will just cursor through, and the microphone is just here, yes. Okay, thank you, Mel. 
Good morning, everyone. For the record, Greg Vade, I'm the Economic Development Representative for the U.S. Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration. I'm very happy to be here today and see see a lot of faces that I've that I've uh, had the pleasure of working with and, and new faces uh, that are here today. So we're here to talk about Hurricane Ian recovery and resiliency. We are here uh, to listen, to understand the issues that are most prominent in uh, the city of Northport, Manatee, Charlotte, and Sarasota County. So I'm very happy, again, to be here. Mel, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, the city, thank you very much for, for hosting us here today. Before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to introduce the team that we have assembled here today. Milton Cochran, my colleague at EDA, uh, is the field coordinator for the economic recovery support function. And he is located at the Joint Field Office in Brandon. And um, he heads up the economic recovery support function. So Milton, if you want to introduce yourself. For, uh... Thank, thanks very much, Brick. And it's definitely my pleasure to, to be here and be a part of this uh, event. And as Greg has stated, we're here really just to listen and learn. And of course, I draw the team of folks that have quite a lot of capacity. And Resources that will hopefully be able to assist you. And we're just delighted to be here and listen and try to learn as much as we can. Thanks, both of you. All right. I'm I have a list of folks that are presumably here today, so I'm just going to read some, some names out. Uh, is David Apple here from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? David, do I see? I don't see David. Uh, Elizabeth Oreck with uh, Community Assistance. Okay. Pre Preeti Shaw. Yeah. Uh, hi. With FEMA. Yeah. Hi, Community Assistance. Eliza Oreck and Kate Apple are on route. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Preeti. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Brandon Perinchak with HUD. I know Brandon. Hi, there you are. Hey, Brandon. Good morning, everyone. Brandon Perinchak, Housing RSF. Thank you. Uh, Brennan Carter. Okay. Joe Woody with USDA. Joe, I saw you this morning. Joe Woody, USDA. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Greg, uh, he's uh, oh, okay. oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Daniel Perry, Preeti, do you know? Uh, she's uh, uh, there. We are. Hey, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, let's see here. Is there any? Any other federal folks that I've missed today? Uh, let's go to state folks. Liz Miller is here from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Hi, good morning. I'm Liz Miller with uh, DEO in Tallahassee. Uh, I work primarily in strategic business development, for economic development for small businesses around the state. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and we will just you know, figure out what it is we can do to help. Thanks, Liz. My friend, Dustin Wells from Enterprise Florida, would you stand up? Good morning. Nice to see a lot of old friends. Uh, here for four years with you guys. I'm back to talk to Greg and Greg and Greg. But in any case, Enterprise Florida, I just want to be here to support. Uh, we're aligning our resources to the municipality and county of Cleveland. Uh, so thanks for having us. <coughs> thanks, Dustin. And um, Regional Planning Council representatives, Margaret Worsley from the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Jim. And Tampa Bay, I know Brian Ellis and Harry Walsh are here. Could you guys stand up? Brian Ellis, uh, Tampa, Bay, uh, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Emergency, emergency management plan. Thank you. Um, so what I'm trying to demonstrate to you today is we have a team effort, state, regional, federal. Um, we're, we're here to learn, again, what the issues are um, in this region, how Hurricane Ian has affected the city and the larger region by definition. We're not going to have all the answers today, but this is the start of a conversation, as Mel said. We're going to be here for the long term. 
our role is supporting long-term economic recovery and resiliency. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So let's see. There we go. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about EDA, what we do, who we are, and hopefully give you some examples of projects that we have supported in other, in other circumstances and other disasters. So just a little bit of little primer here. EDA's mission really is to, su to, to support and lead the federal economic development agenda by promoting innovation and competitiveness across uh, America's um, regions and really to help them grow and develop. We're a relatively small agency in the federal scheme of things. Uh, our budget fluctuates somewhere between 350 million to 400, 400 million, dependent on uh, uh, congressional appropriations. And essentially, we're a grant making agency. We have six regions across the country. I represent, uh, I'm with the Atlanta Regional Office, and we cover eight states in the Southeast US. And I'm the rep for Florida. So, what does that mean? That means that EDA is a very flat organization. If you want to have a project discussion, you call me, and that's that's it, just me. So uh, we we do things uh, that way because we want to have uh, colleagues like uh, colleagues that are in different states, like myself, that live in the states and they understand some of the issues. We've got about 300 staff uh, nationwide. We have a number of investment programs. We call our grants investment programs. Why do we do that? Because we we believe we're making investments in communities. And we also believe that economic development is not one thing. As, as Destin can attest to, economic development is a, is a difficult enterprise. Um, it, you know, you could be anywhere along the trajectory um, in terms of uh, how you achieve economic development. So we have a number of different programs that support your mission or your vision of economic development. And I'm not going to, I don't have enough time to go into each of these programs. This is not, this is not a you know, a data dump today, but we have a number of programs that, that support um, economic development activities, which, which range from planning for economic development to building infrastructure uh, to supporting entrepreneurship. Essentially, we call our grants investments because our investments are made to create jobs and leverage private sector funds. At the end of the day, private sector creates, creates jobs. Federal government doesn't, doesn't create jobs. We just help to create the conditions under which the jobs and economic development occurs. We have a number of different applicants that we work with. Generally speaking, we work with local governments. So we work with cities, towns, villages, uh, the state. We work with our regional planning councils. There's 10 of them in the state of Florida. We work very closely with them. We provide funding to the regional planning councils so they can have an economic development planner that supports um, regional economic development in their respective communities. We work with federally recognized Indian tribes. We work with the grade 28 in the state of Florida, the community colleges. We work with universities. And we work with nonprofit organizations that are doing economic development activities. This slide just gives you sort of a brief snapshot of some of the things we do. Our public works and economic adjustment assistance programs Essentially, those are the two biggest programs that we operate. And under those two programs, we do a lot of different things. So on the construction side, we build facilities. We make infrastructure improvements. We build specialized facilities. Uh, we, can, we can build business incubators. Uh, we're, we've got one coming out of the ground in Tallahassee, the North Florida Innovation Labs. Um, uh, we build workforce training facilities because we understand that workforce workforce training and workforce development is central to the notion of, of a strong economic base. Uh, we do work at airports and port facilities, and we do a lot of work from a legacy standpoint uh, at industrial parks. We also do projects, we support projects that are non-construction in nature. Uh, we do feasibility studies, we do de disaster recovery strategies, uh, we support business development through revolving loan funds, and we, we capitalize revolving loan funds. And increasingly, we've had discussions with folks about how to improve the supply chain, right? How to work out the kinks in the supply chain so we can, we can actually get better inputs delivered uh, more effectively. Okay, so let me pivot now to EDA's role in disaster recovery. We have regular programs that deal with, with economic development on a day-to-day -day basis, but under disaster supplemental footing, 
essentially what our role is to provide um, timely and effective federal economic development assistance to help plan for economic recovery, help to, to um, build projects that will support uh, economic re recovery and resiliency. And essentially, what I leave you with is what we're trying to do is turn a crisis into an opportunity, an opportunity to kind of reimagine and, and think about ways that your economy and your region can be stronger moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about economic recovery. What do we mean by that? Basically, it means returning the economic and business activities to a state of health that, are actually, that is actually stronger than what it was before and develop new lines of business development and opportunities that will help to create a sustainable economy moving forward. Now, what that is, is dependent on you all. We don't have the answers. We don't profess to know what, what animates city of Northport. We don't profess to know what, what matters in Sarasota or Manatee or Charlotte counties. But we expect the leadership within those cities uh, and, and counties to have a good understanding. And, um, and that's how we work. So let's talk about economic resilience. This is, a, this is an idea borrowed from the physical sciences. Essentially, what it means is enhancing a community's or region's ability to um, anticipate, withstand, and recover from disruptions to their economic base. Could be man-made disruptions, could be, could be natural disruptions. And how do you do that? And these are just some examples that communities have followed in the past. Maybe you want to diversify your economy. That's, that's a very laudable goal. A lot of communities uh, have discussed that with, with EDA. So you want to, you want to broaden your industrial base um, so you have a broader footing. Maybe you want to increase business retention and expansion opportunities. And, and we have folks that can talk about that. Maybe you want to build um, resilient infrastructure, right? That's going to withstand physical disruptions. Or maybe you want to do resilience planning. Maybe you want to do a post-disaster recovery plan that kind of looks at the future five years, five years, 10 years down the line and imagines ways that you can build a stronger economy. All of those things make sense. But those are decisions that you all, as the leaders of your respective communities, make. So how does EDA assist when we have a disaster like Hurricane Ian? Uh, when there's a presidential disaster declaration, um, EDA's regional office, the Atlanta regional office in this case, uh, reaches out to our regional planning council friends. So we reached out to all the 10 regional planning councils in the state of Florida, uh, and we, um, we told them to, to be ready to provide assistance and to support their communities. Four of the regional planning councils in the affected area that Hurricane Ian traversed uh, have applications in with EDA right now for supporting disaster recovery coordinator positions. We expect to have those folks on the ground before year's end. And they will provide assistance and fan out to the communities and have discussions with them about economic recovery and, and uh, resilience. So essentially, um, FEMA activates us under a mission assignment. And EDA is responsible to lead the economic recovery support function. What does that mean? It means that we bring together a team of the folks that I talked about uh, before, uh, USDA, HUD, SBA, and others, to really bring together a comprehensive understanding of what it means to help the, the regions recover from the effects of the hurricane, right? We know that the issues are multifaceted. We know that they have a lot of dimension to them. And so that's why we bring uh, a team to bear that is able to address um, all the points. There's three things that we're going to do under this mission assignment. We're going to develop a recovery needs assessment. We're going to develop a recovery uh, options strategy. And probably in some ways, the most important aspect, we are going to hold recovery workshops like this today, right? Because we're gonna go into the communities. Uh, we, have a nut, we have a series of other ones that are in the works that are being planned right now. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna meet with people, we're gonna, we're gonna listen, and we're gonna bring the teams to have discussions with folks. Um, and the last bullet here, the purple bullet. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Thanks, Mel. 
Um, the last point is, is important. Um, right now, all federal agencies are under a um, continuing resolution. Uh, so we have EDA has regular funding right now to bring to bear. If there is a disaster supplemental, then we would have additional resources um, that would be brought to support uh, disaster recovery and resiliency. And this is just a screenshot of, of funding that EDA has received in the past because of, of different, um, different, different disasters that have, um, that have transpired. And um, most recently, uh, EDA received uh, $3 billion under the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, and we deployed those resources in essentially uh, a, little over a little over a year. So uh, we can move quickly. And, and the point that I want to make there is that if you want to talk about projects, we're not going to get into that level of detail today, but certainly call me, have, have those discussions with, with Milton and myself early on so that if there, if, there is, if there are additional resources that are brought to bear, then we can move very quickly and um, work on getting those projects um, developed. So eligible activities, again, planning, infrastructure construction, enhancement, capitalizing revolving loan funds, capacity building. Uh, I mentioned um, supporting disaster recovery coordinators. Uh, that's our mission here right now in Florida, uh, Milton Cochran and myself. And we have missions across the country. Just a quick screenshot here. These are, I've just got two, two slides uh, that I'm going to finish with. These are some projects that we've done in the past. Uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma, uh, we work with the state um, to, to support optimizing the Florida Disaster Biz website and, and optimizing the links in that website. We supported the capitalization of the Rebuild Florida Loan Fund. Uh, we, we provided a, a large grant to DEO, two grants actually, to DEO to support the I guess Rebuild Florida Loan Fund and the Evergreen uh, RLF, Liz, correct me if I'm, did I say those right? Resiliency and Evergreen. Resiliency and Evergreen, yes, yes. And so uh, they're, and they're currently in operation right now, uh, and that's open to <coughs> businesses across the entire state of Florida. Um, I think there was someone from SBDC here. I think, yes, sir, thank you for coming. Um, we supported um, uh, SBDC, the state office. They wanted, um, uh, they were down one of their mobile assistance centers, and we supported the development of a mobile assistance center. So I think, I think it's running around somewhere, right? Uh, so yes, so we're very excited about that project. Um, under the, uh, after the coronavirus hit, uh, we had some additional supplemental funding that came, came out of that. And these are just some projects we did in other communities uh, in Columbia County. Uh, we provided infrastructure enhancements to the uh, Lake City Gateway Airport. We did a project with Visit Florida. I think there was someone here from Visit, uh, Visit Sarasota. Thank you. And we provided um, Visit Florida a $5 million uh, recovery marketing uh, grant to support um, the enhancement of tourism that was hit hard because of the coronavirus pandemic. We supported a virtual trade show that Enterprise Florida put on. Uh, to support small and medium-sized manufacturers that were looking to expand their operations overseas. Uh, and we supported enhancing revolving loan funds across the state of Florida, and we put disaster recovery coordinators uh, into position. So we've done a lot of things. We can do a lot of things. We can't do everything, but if we can, we will. And I'm really here to learn, to listen, and to talk with you folks. I'm very excited to be here. So thank you again for the invitation. And the last slide I want to mention is we have our folks from the regional planning councils here. When you talk to EDA about a project, each project must be consistent with your local comprehensive economic development strategy. So you want to bring your regional planning council representatives into that discussion early. Florida has 10 regional planning councils, and we look to those regional planning councils to develop a comprehensive economic development strategy, to assist with implementation activities, grant writing, technical assistance, um, and also to demonstrate support to EDA of applications that are coming into us. So definitely reach out to your regional planning council folks. They're here today. And that is my contact information. I live in the state of Florida. I'm just on the East Coast. I'm just about two and a half hours east of you folks. I will be back. 
Uh, Milton is here. He is in Brandon. So he's going to be here for the duration of the mission assignment. That's going to go till April, I believe, Milton. And, but I'm not leaving the state of Florida, so I will be here. You can reach me at any time. That's my cell, and that's Milton's contact information. And again, very happy to be here today. Hope I didn't take up too much time talking, sir, and uh, uh, I will stop there. No? Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. All right. Should I do that now? Yeah, go ahead and do that now. Okay, we're going to do um, kind of like uh, truth or consequences or something. Destin, why don't you come down? Sit up here with me. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to get a little closer here. Uh, Brandon, 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 come on up. I don't know that housing is an issue. We have USDA. Go. Okay. Uh, oh, this. Not going to get away with it. <laughs> Some other folks here, but I don't, I don't think we can. We've got one more chair if you want to squeeze one more in. We can find a chair. Destiny, can you guys find one more chair? I'll stand. I'll stand. Well, that's fine. You can do that. Can we'll let you stand. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> yes, we've got mics here. We're going to be bringing them to you. So just a, just a little clarification on the process now. Um, we have, we want you to develop a set of questions around kind of major thematic ideas that are pressing in your municipality, in your region. We're trying to keep this at Greg's wish to kind of keep this at a 20,000 foot kind of level. Um, the example I was given is if we've got a problem with Price Road, we don't want to talk about Price Road today. We want to talk in general about our wider concerns. So if you, um, once we get the first two, and we're going to give you some example questions here because we have put hours together here in the city already. Yeah. <laughs> We are together. Uh, our city manager will be presenting those. And then if you will raise your hand, um, we will let, obviously let our, our, our uh, guests speak to those issues. But then if you've got a question, please raise your hand. We're going to get a microphone to you. We want all of this recorded so you can go back and share this with your colleagues and with whomever in the public needs to see it. So raise your hand, one of our two folks will come to you, and then the same process will follow. You'll have responses by the, uh, the folks from our federal and state agencies. So we're hoping, again, to wrap this up. That makes me the official timekeeper, okay? <laughs> so when I start hearing that we're beating a horse, I'm going to get us to move on. So please don't take it personally. I promise I will try not to be rude in the interruption of you, but if I do this or this, or hey, <laughs> then, you, then you will know I need for you to um, you know, kind of wind it up, okay? And I would appreciate your help in all of that. So let's start. City Manager, I believe you've been given the first two questions. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Thomas. So the city of Northport has three transportation corridors for east to west traffic, of which two became non-operational due to Hurricane Ian. Uh, this is too few to support economic activity for a city of 80,000 people with a build out of 250,000. Therefore, the city completed a 
mobility connectivity study to address the next steps in improving our transportation infrastructure. What resources can the federal and state government bring for the financing, design, and construction of the recommendations in the city's connectivity portion of the mobility fee technical report? Did everybody understand the question? Did everybody hear the question? Nobody didn't hear it. Okay, good. All right. Ah, yes. Wait, wait for, wait for microphone. So I think, <laughs> so I think I heard a little bit of, of your question. You were asking about the transportation corridors and the fact that they, uh, it sounded like they got jammed during the evacuation. And um, I guess I need a little more clarification. What are you kind of looking for, sir? Uh, are you looking to widen these corridors to make them you know, more, um, not only just for business stuff, but also for evacuation purposes, making it a lot easier for people to get, get out? Yes, sir. So of the three, one of them is already planning or we had designs to widen it, um, but we just had not, we have not done it yet and it's in our very near future. But the question that we have is what resources can be provided now that we have seen firsthand that this disaster has shown that we definitely need a better evacuation pathway out or even more different mm -hmm. pathways out that we might need assistance with in designs, planning, and preparing for those future transportation and, portals as well. And that may be something as, as we look into the infrastructure to see what the uh, Department of Transportation, both on the state side, federal side, what programs that they have available that could uh, help with that as well. Um, and then, you know, also we would probably look to some of our uh, federal partners to see if they have some, some programs that are available uh, too. Uh, possibly uh, USDA might have something or I'd look to EDA as well to see if they have uh, some available programs. And then we would try to help coordinate that um, with you as you go through that process. Okay, so it sounds like you're you're just you're asking us to just make sure we follow back up with the relevant departments and their program availability for funding. I, and I would say assistance. yes. We need, you know, like I said, as we go through the recovery process and start looking at it, it's really sit down with you, look in the plans because the other thing we want to look at too is not just the winding, but the resiliency as well to make sure that you know you can widen the road, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to get the people out. You need to make sure that the drainage infrastructure is there so that it's not going to flood. Mm -hmm. So. We would want to look at the resiliency aspect too as well so that's something as we get into the recovery phase we would sit down with you and uh, discuss that and then we would bring the other federal agencies to the table too to see what we could do to help so i hope i've answered your question on that yes thank you sir speak into speak you've got a microphone here if you can speak kind of speak over to that microphone you'll be in good shape Dave, thanks thanks for that response and, and certainly one of the things I wanted to uh, to mention to you all is that um, because this is a coordinator coordinated effort there are projects that EDA can do there are projects that FDOT can do so that's one of the things we'll be looking at what pieces each of us can bring to the table so that'll be an important discussion so so Mr. City Manager that's something we can certainly talk about thank you You're welcome sir are there any other responses or follow-up questions to that kind of question? Okay, moving along then, city manager, you have second. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Destin, would you introduce yourself again, please? Um, Destin Wells with Enterprise Florida. Um, just one thing I wanted to mention is to, to really make sure that you're looking to leverage the opportunity. So it's not a matter of finding one program or one bucket for any of these issues. It's looking for all the different resources that can be brought to bear and to leverage. So for example, the state has the Florida Job Growth Grant Fund, which was nearing exhaustion prior to the storm, but there was still some resource left. And that resource now has been shifted and aimed towards Southwest Florida. And so there could be some opportunity to take some of those resources, leveraging those with perhaps some of the EDA funding, which today is a 50-50 model, but under the instance of disaster supplemental, it would be just a 20? It would be an 80-20% uh, uh, situation. So, so 
So, so in any instance, I guess the point I'm trying to make is just make sure that we are leveraging by tapping into the multiple different buckets and matching those. Uh, and then I think to, to the point that was made by Greg, make sure that the buckets that we're tapping into are the most appropriate because there might be some of those that can only address road infrastructure. Um, so you wouldn't want to go in and, and look for a resource that's not matched to the highest and best um, because you might need that bucket of money for a different need within the community or within the region. So, And, and Dustin makes a good point. I'm just going to add, add to what Dustin said here as well. Um, when you think about a project, think about it comprehensively, right? So if you're doing a roadway project, you may have stormwater uh, associated with it. You may have sidewalks associated with it. You may have um, underground uh, electricity uh, associated with it. We did a project in uh, City of Lake Worth Beach where we did a road widening project um, in that community. And that had stormwater uh, underground uh, electricity, um, and it also had um, uh, uh, fiber as well. So think about projects as comprehensively as you can, because this is this could be an opportunity to to have all the elements funded. We're you know we're fairly able to sort out the different pieces of a project. So it, it can be more than just a roadway. It can be roadway plus the other elements that make that up. And we can obviously. Um, we can con conceptualize that when we're talking about project development. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Any other questions on this subject? Commissioner Luke? Those east-west corridors were completely obliviated. I mean, trying to get evacuation was null and void. Uh, but we also had an issue at our 75 interchanges. Both of those main evacuation routes going out were totally flooded, couldn't go. You had to go down 41. It took hours to get three miles. So the interchanges on 75 are also vitally important to be addressed for evacuation purposes. This taught us a whole lot. Thank you, Commissioner. Other ideas, thoughts? Any others? Going once, going twice. Uh, uh, <laughs> please go ahead. I introduce like yourself add, if you don't mind. Um, as we are kind of discussing uh, future planning, I just would like to uh, encourage you all to also keep in mind some of the public health and environmental health uh, concerns. And so from an HSS perspective, uh, we do have a resource within the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response called Asper Tracy. They do have a topic collection on evacuations, and so it does provide some lessons learned uh, and promising practices from other disaster events that can be a part of that recovery <coughs> planning process. In addition to that, uh, within the Health and Social Services Recovery Space, uh, we do have several branches, one of which is a public health and environmental health branch. We work very closely with our CDC partners uh, who will also be on site with us throughout the duration of this mission. And so if there are opportunities for us to provide any rapid technical assistance and planning and just supporting the planning and providing some considerations from an environmental health standpoint, um, we are available to do that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move along to your second question, city manager sits, I believe you still probably have the floor. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And speaking of um, flooding and rain, the city experienced 15 to 20 inches of rain, resulting in the main watershed, the Mayakahatchee Creek, rising by over eight feet and flooding citywide. An economic development um, free from, excuse me, an economic environment free from the dangers of flooding is necessary to attract and retain businesses and the customer base to support them. Um, what resources, uh, again, for financing, design, construction, of the antiquated water control structures that we have in operation, as well as to build um, the water reservoir necessary, as suggested in the city's 2019 Big Slough Flood Reduction Study, would you advise us to pursue? <laughs> I'm looking at David again. Uh, again. <laughs> you should just come on up here. Yeah, come on up, David. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, to answer your question, yes, there are programs out there. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers does have what we call our Continuing Authorities Program, 
where we can uh, partner with uh, a government entity to do a study. Uh, there is a cost share on that, um, and there is a process that you would need to go through, but we can bring to the table doing the actual uh, study itself, looking at the flooding issues, and then we can also bring the construction dollars as well. So that's something that the, uh, the city can look into. Uh, the Corps also has some other programs too as well that um, we can uh, look at that could possibly help too. We'd have to really, really what it comes down to is we have to see what the issues are, what you're looking at, and then see what core programs possibly could fit into that. Now, if the core doesn't have some programs, there are, you know, we would also bring the other government agencies to see what is available to as well. But uh, something like that, I think that could be something the core could help you with. And, and that's something that EDA can also provide assistance with, and David and I will have to fight over that. But uh, so, <laughs> thanks too. But we, you know, we can certainly, uh, we, we, we funded studies before, so we can certainly do that. And we funded stormwater projects uh, in downtown areas uh, as a result of hurricanes and things of that nature. So again, it's gonna be a, a multi-coordinated effort. Uh, certainly US Army Corps could potentially take a, take a piece of it. We could take another piece of it. So that's something we could cooperate collaboratively on. Yeah, um, Joe Wood of USDA, since we're talking debris and yes, watersheds. Sir. Uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, since we've got several counties and municipalities represented, represented today, they've extended their registration for their uh, emergency watershed protection program that gets the debris out of the waterways and looks at stream bank erosion and stuff. So what we're encouraging is everyone to register, whether it's going to be funded through USDA or FEMA, public assistance. We're encouraging everybody to register by the deadline in January. So you can get your projects on the book and we can come out along with FEMA and look at the projects and see who will pay for what. So that's something to consider. Thank you. One other thing that uh, came to mind too, uh, Greg, I think you might be Paul. During Hurricane Michael, Mexico Beach was uh, you know, devastated from the storm surge and stuff. One of the things they were looking at is they wanted to get their stormwater discharges off the beach because that was their source of income because everybody came to Mexico Beach to, to be on the beach and stuff. But when you see these groundwater plumes coming in from the, uh, the rivers and stormwater systems, they said that detracted. So what we did is we sat down with them, uh, myself, EPA, and we looked at what we could do to uh, basically replumb the system. So we came up with some solutions and stuff, and then EPA was able to help with some funding on that because we looked at... Um, rerouting the stormwater through an old wetland that was a dump, see about cleaning out that dump and creating a wetland again and rerouting it back to the river. So we were essentially taking that discharge that was going to the Gulf and disrupting the beach and taking it out in another place. So that's another opportunity too. We can look at EPA as well. And that may be something also that EDA may be able to help with the funding. So what I'm saying to you is there's a lot of opportunity avenues. It's just we have to really sit down and look and see what the issues are, what the problems are, and then figure out how do we move forward? How can we help you get to where you need? And I think that's the, really the big dialogue that we'll need to have as we go through this recovery effort. Thank you. Thank you. And I was just going to add something to, to the city manager's question there. Please. Um, one of the things I'll leave you with too, as, as David and I were, were talking, is when you're thinking about these projects, think about developing the scope of work, right? So, so describe the project in, in as much detail as you can and think about the budget, right? The prospective budget for the project and think about the, the, um, the scale of the project. Is it gonna be regional in nature? Those are the questions that are gonna be important for EDA and they'll, they'll be important for USDA and, 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 and um, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, right? So, so then we can sort of take that project and start to understand it better and have internal discussions about who would be the appropriate funding partner for, for something like that. So again, be as, be as, as, as comprehensive as you can, sir, when you, when you think about these things. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any questions no. to follow up on that? Any answers to follow up on that, Destin? Um, I think from what I'm hearing, one of the opportunities is when you're looking at these projects, frame them as many different ways as you can. So we talked about the east-west transportation lines. 
That's public safety, that's transportation, that's environment. Those are different agencies, different programs, different funding sources, same project, framed three different ways. Um, so I think not to beat that horse or anything of that nature, but just make sure that we're looking at these and telling the story so that we can access the utmost of resource and support. Any other comments? Okay, I believe those are the ones from city at this point. We'd like to move to some of the other counties or municipalities. Do I have anyone with a burning desire to speak up? Yes, sir. That was Bernie. Go ahead. <laughs> wait, wait for your microphone, please, sir. And tell us who you are and who you're with. Uh, Jim Birch uh, with the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council. Um, are you um, on? Yeah, it should be on. Okay, there you Can go. You hear me Get out? it to your mouth. Yeah. Okay. So uh, from the uh, Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council, um, th this is a familiar sign. I'm a former mayor in Cape Coral also, so I'm, I'm very local. Um, Gre Greg, you, talk, you said something earlier uh, about uh, being the point of contact. Uh, it, it makes so much difference. The, the, the dialogue we just had from so many agencies, from so many different types of people, um, I think it's incumbent, incumbent upon all of us to say, okay, where are the points of contact that we must focus? Greg Bidet, you are absolutely number one on the list right for that. You, you've, already, you've already volunteered for that. Um, but the planning councils uh, in the region, the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council, who I'm with, Margaret here as well, um, and there's, there's 10 of us out there. Let's try and keep our communication going in that direction. Um, I see an awful lot of nonprofits, an awful lot of different places in elected areas, and an awful lot of people wanting a lot of things. Let's try and keep them at least focused and funneled down to certain areas so that we can get an idea for people like Greg today to see reasonably what we need, how many people need it, and that we don't end up with redundancy in the same, at the same process. Because yes, there's a lot of money, but redundancy and those kinds of things will soak that money dry very quickly. Uh, and Greg, we learned one thing during the CARES Act. What we learned was that smaller small business was left behind because there was so much noise out there. Uh, we wanted to limit the noise, try and get this down, and keep it at least focused down into a certain area and a certain amount of people. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Commissioner Langdon. Yes, uh, thank you, Mel. Um, in Northport, about 70 to 80 percent of our businesses are home-based. So those business owners who lost their homes also lost their businesses. So the concern is, particularly with the 50 percent rule for rebuilding, the concern is that we will lose a lot of our small business owners because they simply won't be able to afford that build back. What programs or agencies might be available to business owners in that sort of gray area? Because it's their home, but it's also their business. I'm looking okay. at you, Brandon. <laughs> Tell us who you are and, yeah. This is Brandon Perinchak, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am the uh, long-term housing a recovery coordinator. So um, uh, the housing component of that, all housing, planning, zoning, roles are local. So we really do not have a, uh, a voice in um, how, what decisions are made in that rebuilding effort, the 50-50 role. We don't have a voice in that. Um, from a economic development perspective, we do not have any specific programs on a with a, a normal appropriation that would address the home-based businesses. I certainly can sympathize with your concerns. Um, that's a big number. 70, 80 percent is a big number. Um, but again, all planning is local, and it would have to look at that matter. Of course, we do want to support sustainable, resilient, long-term recovery efforts. I understand that component of it. Um, but from a, from a housing perspective, that has to be addressed at, at the local level. I, I do apologize. That's a good answer. 
<laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping I didn't exceed your expectations. <laughs> I, I will take that question back to uh, Rep. Mark Malkin's administration, unfortunately, was unable to, to participate. And that is a discussion we've had uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, to that point. And we recognize that is a, a challenge, and I will definitely uh, get your information and, and get you an, an, an answer. I appreciate that. Certainly. Commissioner McDowell, Destiny, if you could get. You can tell this is going to be a very important question because it piggybacks off Commission, uh, Vice Mayor <coughs> Landis. Because 80% of our businesses are home-based and a lot of our homes were destroyed, a lot of businesses rely on people who don't have homes to live in. Not only the home-based businesses, their employees, no matter what those numbers are, and regionally the employees that travel outside which is around 90% travel outside, they don't have homes anymore. So we need to make sure that we have homes for the employees and they've all been pretty much destroyed. So we need some resources for housing to keep the employees here instead of leaving our area, which then makes businesses not have anybody to work for. Thank you. Uh, I do know in some other disasters, uh, the cities in their recovery planning looked at uh, multifamily housing complexes for the service industry workers. Uh, we're from Tennessee. We had a fire in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And like here, everybody traveled about an hour for minimum wage jobs. So they started developing uh, several multifamily housing complexes as part of their recovery efforts. So that's something to consider. Uh, I saw this. Spent a lot of time here in Florida with those disasters. I've been here for Irma and Michael. Um, following Hurricane Irma, one of the biggest challenges was workforce housing um, in Monroe County, particularly the Keys. Um, prior to the storm, um, Ir Irma, the workforce, um, the low to minimum, you know, moderate wage workforce would commute two hours each way from Hollywood, Florida into the Keys just to work. Um, one of the things that Monroe County did was use some of their county property, because a lot of the county workers couldn't even afford to live in the Keys. Um, so they used county property to develop um, workforce housing, housing for their uh, county employees. That included teachers from the school district as well. So that's also a consideration um, when you're looking at supporting uh, your local employees um, when you're rebuilding, if you do have county property and resources like that. Yeah. Hi, Shay Atler with DTC Engineering Company. Um, with regards to uh, programs for houses, uh, my first house when I was 23 was under a HUD 203K program. And the city of New Haven had a person who was funded by uh, economic development to help with the paperwork because and as a young person with no money, it was very difficult to understand how to get through the government process. And allowed me to become a homeowner and you know, rehab a house in an area that was improving and improve the whole area. And I thought about uh, 203H, which is another program for any area that was potentially declared an emergency disaster, you can get money through, through y'all. So maybe one of the opportunities here would be to have a, an officer help people with the, the paper process because it's really difficult you know, while you're trying to survive and live and run a business to also do the paperwork, if you can help them, you know, you have a program in place, sort of, that might, you know, solve some problems all at once. As far as housing goes, we're doing the assessments for a few counties south of here for uh, Hurricane Ian, and I worked on Wilmot and Ike as well in Gallison. The problem here is uh, go to your, your app and Expedia or Travelocity, try to find a hotel room for your workers down there. It's impossible. And so you think of the Atlanta model with the Olympics, they built the Olympic stadiums and so forth, eventually with a long-term plan to uh, transition those to Georgia Tech and other agencies. So there's an opportunity to provide you know, housing for temporary workers during the, you know, the cleanup process, restoration process, and that's going to take years. And eventually that transitions into workforce housing longer term. So you can you know, kill two birds with one stone. So I think you said, how do we create an opportunity out of the disaster that you know, helps a lot of people? And that seems like you know, a great way to hit all those points. So maybe a suggestion is a 203K officer, to, you know, H officer, and maybe 
some temporary housing that becomes permanent for workforce in the region. So. Uh, interestingly, uh, there was a resort that was built short in the Keys, uh, right on the northern side of what is it, Ten Mile Bridge, uh, by the Tiki Bar. Uh, that resort, when they broke ground on that resort, the first building they built was workforce housing for the construction workers that were building that resort. That building then transitioned to workforce housing for the folks that worked at that resort once it was open full time. It's a great model. It's extremely important. To your 203K, 203H questions, um, I implore folks if, if you're, and we could provide flyers for this, I can have flyers sent down, I can bring them down myself. Housing counseling, HUD approved housing counseling agencies are amazing and they are local. When you call our housing, um, housing counseling hotline, the first thing you're going to do is put in a zip code. It's going to direct you to housing counselors in your jurisdiction. These are HUD approved housing counselors that go through a very rigorous process and recertification process every year to be able to speak to and support clients with our programs. Um, 203K, 203H, as I was sitting here at the beginning of the program today, I received an email from our FHA center that said they have, they just provided a new um, handout that compares 203K and 203H programs. It's an updated flyer. I haven't even looked at it yet. Um, just came to my phone. But those are options. Housing counseling can work with folks to develop budgets if they're looking to be first time home buyers. Uh, there is dozens of programs within the housing counseling uh, services that can support individuals. We also have uh, disaster recovery resources provided through housing counseling. Um, so I can provide those uh, brochures. We can have them sent down if that would help communities here and you can put them at your local town halls, county offices, et cetera. Thank you. Does anybody have more on housing or the need for workforce housing or transitioning housing or? Okay, Shay, Shay, one more time, go ahead. Uh, the other thing is the pressure upon people migrating north from areas that are impacted to uh, counties up here put an impact upon rental housing in the short term. So you're seeing a big spike. In addition, we're going to the, the season, as we call it here, whereby we're gonna have a lot of people visiting us from Canada northward. And you know that puts pressure on top of that pressure. So there's gonna be a, a tremendous amount of spiking in rentals uh, coming up really shortly. It's happening now. So that's when you gotta address as well, because we're gonna start pushing our workers out of the area because of that pressure, so. And that's certainly a challenge we see everywhere. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, Ida tangentially impacted Pennsylvania last year. And we had individuals, voucher holders, HUD voucher holders, who could move, had an apartment. They were living in an apartment that was damaged. We had to put them, they were actually put up by FEMA in a hotel up until this past July, August. They had a voucher to move into an apartment. There were no landlords that were willing to accept the price of the voucher. It's the fact that landlords, I mean, we are trying, imploring landlords to um, be a part of our voucher program so that we can assist more clients. You know, there's emergency housing vouchers on the streets. There's from the um, CARES Act, Home ARP, um, among others, and there are existing vouchers. But if there are landlords that are seeing ultimately the dollar sign of can I get $3,000 rent versus, you know, $1,500 rent a month? What am I going to take? And that's a big challenge. It's not just here in disaster prone areas. It is everywhere in the country. Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, for example. You wouldn't think of it, but it's going on. We have, I mean, we have workforce that have very high paying jobs that can't afford apartments, can't afford rent, that are moving two, 300 miles away from their jobs. Um, because they can't afford it. So how do we also address that broader issue of the expensive housing? Anyone else? Thank you for that. I've got one more comment. Okay, go ahead. Well, I think, I mean. And Liz, if you make sure you speak up and tell them who you are. Yeah. 
Hi, Liz with uh, DEO in Tallahassee. And I just wanted to speak to um, the percentages that you shared with us, Commissioner, on the 7 to 80 per, 70 to 80 percent of the small businesses are home based. Um, I do not have an answer for you, but I want you to know that I am taking very diligent notes and I will take that back with me um, to see, you know, what type of options that we may have available or how we can look at um, being creative in that venue. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Langdon. I have a somewhat related question. Um, we have had a co-work facility here in Northport that was destroyed um, in Ian. So my question is, might that be an opportunity for the city to really build an incubator, a, a true incubator, to replace that? So I'd love your advice on how we might go about doing that. Commissioner, very good, very good question. Uh, EDA builds incubators. And um, so the, my, my, my broad answer to your question is, um, develop the project scope of work, develop the budget. Um, we have certain requirements for incubator projects, but essentially what we want to know is that there is need and demand that, that is satisfied for, for an incubator because we don't want to build a facility that's not going to be utilized for the purpose. So we want to know that there's, that there's a good level of entrepreneurship demand for an incubator. And the other thing that you're going to want to do is to the extent that you could, you could discern what kind of incubation program you're going to provide, that's going to be helpful to us. There's many different types of incubators. You know, there's high-tech incubators, there's wet lab incubators, there's general purpose incubators, there's retail incubators. So to, I'm not trying to make it more co complicated, but to the extent that you can, you can tell us what is the profile of the entrepreneurs that might be using those services, um, that's going to be helpful. And I can have a, I can have a, a conversation with, with um, Ms. Thomas about that. Sure. That might help solve the home-based business issue by giving those folks a place to and, work. And I would also recommend um, the Florida um, Business Incubation Association as a good resource to uh, to connect with. Um, they're uh, they're they're Florida wide, and they have uh, they have consultants that they work with. And so uh, I'll I'll provide a contact for you after this meeting, Commissioner. You. You're welcome. Looking for any other comments on workforce, workforce-related housing, any of those topic areas still popping up around? Yes, ma'am. I've got Karima Havity over here. Thank you, Mel. Um, so for workforce, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that Career Source and Ghost, and we work closely with DEO, thanks. Um, we are providing temp employment for um, any disaster re re relief and recovery. So when you're talking about hiring officers to even, you know, process applications or work any type of disaster relief, we will be paying them out of our grant. Or I do like what you call investment program instead of grant. Um, so we do, we would like to see that, to note that, um, to let you all know that all of your agencies can use our funds to hire folks temporarily to work. And we're paying good wages, up to $20 an hour. So if you need workforce, call on the workforce people, which is career resource like that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Barbara, why don't you tell people who you are? So Barbara Careers, United Way of South Sarasota County. Um, you know, I just appreciate everybody being here and the resources in the room are really phenomenal. Um, United Way, we're, we're trying to think out of the box a little bit um, to get some things done related to workforce housing. Um, I've got some great partners here that are willing to work with me and have some great solutions. Um, Chris from Suncoast Partnership, thank you for your partnership. Um, uh, Kareem up for work, Career source, thank you for that. Um, so we've got some out of the box thinking and we've got some solutions that I'd like to share. Um, I'm just not sure who the right people are to put in the room. 
for that. So Mel, you could probably advise us, I'm sure, right? Yes. OK, all right. So, so Chris from Suncoast Partnership. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Johnson from Suncoast Partnership. We're the lead agency for the COC in both Sarasota and Manatee counties. And so my question, I guess, with everyone in the room, and this is just, I'm just thinking about, of course, the housing issues and things that most all of us know about very well around here, the increases in rents, as the gentleman mentioned earlier, the migration of people, we're in season, all of that kind of thing. My question is, with all of the different funding that's available and the planning that's available, um, is there some way or is, is there some group that can help us in the wake of disaster and the loss of housing that we have to plan how we rebuild that, right, to better serve the communities that are in need? We know that our current, and I look at housing as infrastructure as well, right, so our current housing infrastructure wasn't sustainable for our communities by and large. And we all knew that that was happening. It's been built over 20, 30 years. Is that happening? Um, are, are there groups that are available? Because I hear a lot of like planning and, and resources in that regard. Is there some resource we can plug into for that planning process to help us as a community in the wake of disaster? Uh, oh, the quick answer would be would, we can connect you with peer-to-peer -peer for other communities that have experienced this, um, that have gone into, you know, that mindset of sustainable resilient housing especially areas that have been impacted i know there are philanthropic resources out there um, i'm looking at denise um, there are philanthropic resources that are available we can you know florida has a lot of resources um, and data available uh, i think the schimberg center um, at the university of florida um, their you know bright community trust is very interesting and in some of the projects they've worked on um, that the long and short of it is, yes, we can talk. Uh, you know, we want to look at that long-term sustainability for these communities. I mean, that's what the you know reco housing recovery support function is, is, not just rebuilding, but rebuilding stronger, better um, for the long term. Just add as well to your question, I think um, we understand that housing underpins workforce, right? So. So it's certainly, we're gonna be looking at it as part of our um, recovery needs options and recovery needs assessment. It's, it's part of economic development. It's a, it's a foundational element of economic development. Th then the question becomes, I'm looking at, 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 at Brandon, um, you know, whether, whether you know, EDA funds something like that or whether HUD does. And that's, that's something that we'll, we can discuss internally. You don't have to worry about that so much from, from the outside standpoint. But definitely, we know that housing, infrastructure, workforce, all those issues underlie economic development. Without, without housing, without workforce development, you don't have an economy. I mean, so we're, we're very mindful of that. And that's going to be a central focus uh, of our recovery need strategy. And we're going to be you know, working in close collaboration with HUD and also Florida Housing Finance um, Coalition, um, the lady. Um, What's the lady's name, Brandon? Um, Gladys Cook. Gladys Cook. She's a great resource, um, and and definitely um, they're they're in Tallahassee, and we'll we will bring them down to some other recovery workshops we have done in the past, and so they can provide a little bit more local technical um, assistance and and knowledge. Right. Yes. I mean, we have great partners at DEO, of course. Um, we work very close with DEO, um, Florida Housing. Um, Finance Corporation and Florida Housing Coalition. So we will def we have great partners. It's not just that we're going to be doing this in a silo. Um, we have great folks here at the state that we work with, um, both Blue Sky and Post Disaster, uh, and we have maintained those relationships and look forward to working with our partners. Not to beat again, as as Brandon said, not to beat a dead horse, but um, uh, after Hurricane Irma. Monroe County um, asked EDA to provide funding to do a post-disaster recovery strategy. And so we provided funding for such a thing. And that covered housing, workforce development, infrastructure, um, environmental needs, uh, you name it. All, all the re requisite subject areas you would think that were impacted by, by Hurricane Irma were addressed in that study. Now, the question then is, who is going to implement the recommendations in the study? That, that, so, so definitely the study has to come first. And then we can we can work out the, the details once the study has determined the the path forward, right? 
but we can we can definitely fund something. We have funded those plans before, and we expect that we're going to have needs um, to fund plans like that. Because again, what I said at the beginning is use this as an opportunity to think about how to create a more resilient and and um, sustainable economy. And if you can do that through through an initial burst of planning activity, which might be six or eight months in duration, and then really focus on the next steps, I think that's really going to be helpful. I'm an urban planner by background, um, and so uh, I, I do recognize the value of it. Um, and so that's just something to think about, right? Just get it done, get it done quickly, and then, um, you know, um, show the way forward, and then we can we can develop the, the funding mechanisms. We can recommend the funding mechanisms to, to help implement the project. I think I saw Destin aiming for the speaker. I, I just want to say, think about dirt. Um, you know, I, it's it's kind of strange when we're going through something like this. You have a lot of homes, a lot of people affected, and so the immediate thought, of course, and should go to how are you going to support those people? How are you going to get them through this time? But be thinking about dirt. Be thinking about the longer term. Um, I know this is a regional thing, but I am going to make one Northport comment. You got a lot of it, right? It's a massive municipality. And so identifying where are those areas of opportunity where workforce housing might go, multifamily housing could go. If there is water and sewer and fiber and different things that are the but for those, the developer is not necessarily interested. Use this as that opportunity to make those identifications, pursue the resources to put that in. So um, it, it, it sounds a little strange to skip over the most immediate right in front of us thing and, and need. Um, but I just encourage you in, in terms of housing, think about dirt. Uh, to the point about local policy and, and everything there, it's everything. I mean, you know, housing is driven at the local community. And so what are the policies that we can put in place to encourage the development of these and to preserve them? Um, this was an issue well before Ian. Uh, Ian exacerbated it to the nth degree. Um, I think it's something that we've, we've always struggled to kind of address. And now we're in a situation where we have a thousand people moving into the state of day, Southwest Florida, a very popular destination amongst that. The market forces are really blowing in the face of affordability. So look at what we control, identify dirt, put in the infrastructure. If you have things that are municipal or county controlled that you have that appetite or interest, that is a massive head start in that game. Um, but think about dirt. Thank you. And okay, we've got Sharon Hillstrom in the back, back there. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, good morning, Sharon Hillstrom with the Bradenton Area Economic Development Corporation. I did want to speak to the commissioner's uh, comment regarding a business incubator. We actually do have a business incubator at State College of Florida. It's called 26 West. It's on the Bradenton campus. However, there is a Venice campus for State College of Florida, so perhaps some outreach activities could be initiated to support um, some of those home-based businesses because you know, if you think about what happened with the pandemic, a lot of folks left the workforce and were starting their own businesses and probably most of them were home-based. So that was a really good comment the commissioner made about that, but I did want to mention that there is a business incubator and it's a really vibrant space, but I can't imagine that there couldn't be outreach services from the Venice campus to support the folks in Northport. Also, through Career Source Suncoast, there's a program called Thrive, which also is available to support um, entrepreneurs. And then in terms of the workforce housing question, um, we are working towards creating a pilot project in Manatee County, whereby we're doing a public-private partnership. Um, we have been meeting, so far we've met with 12 different companies that have a very strong interest in building workforce housing. Um, most of the companies wouldn't want to do it on their own because they don't have enough employees that would need like one space for their particular company. But what we're looking to do is bring several companies together to find not just workforce housing itself, but a workforce housing community that provides wraparound services like healthcare, transportation, all those types of things that are barriers for folks for employment. Um, we recognize that the private sector can't do this alone, the public sector can't do this alone. So 
we're putting together the private sector side right now, and then we're going to the public sector to say, what is your skin in the game? Um, so uh, we're really excited about this. We have a lot of interest in it. So it's another way to kind of approach this workforce housing challenge that we have. Uh, the public-private partnership was a huge success in the city of Baltimore uh, for getting and maintaining teachers in the city of Baltimore. Um, a, they formed a corporation um, that turned into a public-private partnership that built a very, they took a derelict warehouse in a very impoverished neighborhood in Baltimore and turned it into a state-of-the-art um, teaching lab. And it was a huge success. It is thriving to this day, and it's maintained teachers in that community rather than, you know, because they couldn't afford to live in the community. There was no available housing. What was available was, um, astronomically expensive. Now they have fantastic living opportunities for teachers in that city because of a public-private partnership. Sharon, did you have your hand up again? I'm sorry. Is that it? Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm very excited to hear about the public-private partnership and just want to add in there, in terms of the of the true collaboration and coordination that's going to happen out of all these federal agencies that are here with us, I, I'm here from FEMA, as well. Um, the combination of our community assistance team and all of our federal partners is really going to be that coordination piece. They're all going to come together. They're putting, they're going to be putting together recovery support strategy. Um, the information they hear about from you is really critical in what goes into that and what, and what is identified as the true needs. We also have capacity <clears throat> for grant research. Um, we have a database that uh, information is entered on a daily basis at our FEMA headquarters, and we have access to that when we receive some information from our partners about projects or communities that are identifying projects. We have some research capability to uh, identify all the resources that line up with that. So everything you're thinking about now, um, we'll have an opportunity for everybody to look at those projects and, and find out what all the possible resources are. And philanthropy is at the beginning stages here. I actually created the philanthropy program at FEMA headquarters. And the state of Florida and some of the uh, philanthropic partners are really interested in coming together and leveraging funds and supporting things like public-private partnerships. So more to come on that. We're in the early stages. Thank you. Anything, Commissioner Luke? In thinking about uh, workforce training facilities and incubators and things like that, we have a technical center that only has accomplished phase one. They haven't even been able to accomplish phase two. But they could actually be a resource for all of these to be assembled at that one location. How would uh, Suncoast Technical College, who would they approach in regards to being able to be a one-stop shop for a lot of these items? Well, I would, Commissioner, I would, I would just encourage them to contact me for, for that initial discussion. Uh, and, and to the extent that we can help, I'll, I'll provide further guidance on that. And um, uh, Mel has my contact information, so please just ask them to give me a call. I'm available almost 24 hours a day, except for sleeping. But other than that, I'm, I'm available. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. And if I could mention one last thing on housing, uh, the state of Florida has, you know, they it's great. They pulled together a state disaster housing task force. Um, it's chaired by our partners at FDEM, Florida Department of Emergency Management and Florida Housing Coalition, but it's consistent of a lot of folks, organizations such as those in this room, our partners at DEO and, um, it, it, it's wonderful because they are thinking about this very early on in the recovery process. That's very important. Recovery starts at day one, and the state, I can tell you, is really focused on this, especially from a housing perspective and our address, working towards identifying the biggest challenges and hurdles and, and figuring out ways to address those. Thank you. Any other questions on this, on these topics that we've covered so far? It doesn't mean we can't come back to them, but um, looking for other
county or city municipalities to speak up? Oh, good. You can go to that then, Rob Lewis, right, who's with Sarasota First of all, County. For the city of Northport pulling us all together right, well, with these resources. Uh, and I'm sure some other uh, chambers will mention this. I'm Rob Lewis from Sarasota County Government. My question is, with the federal money we already knew was going to be uh, coming through the state for broadband, uh, have you all as a group or individual agencies thought about how that can be leveraged with what you may have as potential resources? Because I know in some pockets of at least our county, um, the, the internet being damaged or inaccessible was an immediate problem, from, but from an economic recovery standpoint, it will become an even bigger issue to be addressed. And from a resiliency standpoint, looking forward, something to be improved because I think Florida will continue to be impacted by storms. Uh, Who wants to tackle okay, the broadband so We don't have here. Katie Smith here from uh, DEL, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, think, I think obviously Katie Smith and the broadband office are working on that issue very diligently. Um, EDA can, uh, can be involved in, in, in broadband, uh, but I'll just point out that, that our sister agency at Broadband USA uh, has has robust funding programs for uh, for broadband deployment, but it is a, it is an issue that EDA can certainly look at. So um, um, again, we're, if, when we look at broadband, we're going to look at it from an economic recovery standpoint. So we're going to look at it not sort of widely de deployed, but but from a standpoint of sort of correcting any deficiencies. So all that to say, we can look at it. Uh, we may be able to take a piece of it, uh, and there may be other 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 sources that could could help with that issue so just just give me a call sir i'll be happy to to discuss it further with you offline the same goes for usda we'll do broadband too but based on rural nature like you know northport and some of the areas around here are going to be ineligible based on population but certain pockets of the counties might be eligible and certain if you look at concentrated projects we might be able to do through some of our programming and this, this is where the stacking is really so critical because, you know, Greg mentioned Katie and the Office of Broadband within DEO. Um, you know, they were only stood up after the 2021 legislative session. Um, they've been going through a process of, you know, learning, understanding, planning, putting things together. Um, they have $400 million that will be deployed throughout the state. Um, I know that in the most immediate term, there was a bias towards rural communities. Um, I think that some of that bias is now augmented by the affected communities from the storm. Um, so when I talk about leverage, I mean, here we're talking about USDA, the EDA, DEO, and the Office of Broadband. So again, we can stack these things up to try to take as big a bite of the challenge as we can. Um, so just want to make sure to point that out. Let's not forget the important starting local though. Our NTIA works uh, in conjunction, but understanding where those gaps are, I, most people probably did not hear you. <laughs> it's unfortunate we didn't get a microphone. Would you mind kind of hitting those high spots again for me? I was only saying how important it is going to be for uh, local folks to put those uh, areas of interest that they have for supporting broadband. Uh, up to the state uh, to make certain that they're aware of what the gaps are and what the needs are as it relates to supporting broadband. Thank you. Is there anybody else on the subject of broadband or something similar? Here we go, please. Thank you. Uh, not particularly specifically broadband, but hearing all of the, the answers, yours in particular, that says that Northport or parts of Northport may not qualify because of population, but part of the other region can. Um, I've heard so many things from so many people that I, I can't stress enough how important the planning councils are, and, and Greg and this whole group uh, recognize that there's federal assistance, there's state assistance, uh, there's also local assistance, and the regional planning councils that are here, I see Tampa Bay over there, uh, Southwest region here, um, your comment about collaboration is so important. Um, please, I can't, absolutely cannot say it enough times. 
that you have got to go, all the elected leaders, all of the other nonprofits, as many people as can, go to your planning councils and put your information there, let them talk to the other people. Um, silo thinking, people that will continue to work on them, their own and work on their own best interests will never ever succeed from a regional basis. We need this to be a regional recovery. This is a re regional disaster and we need this whole thing to be a, a recovery in the same vein. So uh, we're the Southwest Florida Regional Planning Council. Please talk to us if you're anywhere in that region where there's six counties or uh, Charlotte, Sarasota, Henry Glades, uh, Collier and Lee. Um, the, the Tampa Bay uh, RPC I, I see is over there. There, there. there are lots of them. There's 10 of them in the state. Use them now. Now is a good time. We talked about planning. We are a planning council. Please come to us and let's get collaboratively, collaboratively together with your people in design, with your people in, in uh, economic development, whatever. Uh, let's try and make this thing an opportunity out of a crisis, as you were saying. Thanks. Right, and I just want to add to what Jim was saying uh, and to the, gentleman, uh, the gentleman's question from Sarasota County. One of the things that the regional planning councils have done previously, they've done economic asset-based mapping. So that's really important. Again, at the 35,000 foot level, you know, what are your colleges, what are your universities, what are your incubators, what are your uh, railroad assets, your transportation assets, your airports, ports, and things like that, because that's going to be really important for us to understand where they're spatially located, right, and how they're connected on a regional basis. So again, think of, I'm not here to sell planning, but, but that's, that's an activity that is directly suited for um, the, the resources and technical capabilities that are housed in the regional planning councils here in this room today. So again, if, if that's something that's important to get people's minds thinking about where some regional projects could be brought to, to bear, again, thinking stormwater and other, other issues which cross boundaries, um, use the resources of the regional planning councils. It's, it's, it's not going to cost folks any money. So it's, it's, it's an important resource. Take advantage of it. And I would highly recommend you make those connections. So just wanted to add to what Jim said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question down front. Please, please identify yourself and tell us who you're with. Hello, my name is uh, Harry Walsh with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. So just wanted to Thank Greg and echo what he said is obviously if you're in Manatee County, please contact us or please uh, contact Southwest uh, RPC. Um, so I kind of had a, uh, a point to make and then I wanted to uh, get some thoughts from the room. So obviously right now it's emergency response, it's disaster recovery. And so there are funds available. There's a lot of attention. Obviously that's why we're all here in this room. Say two years down the line, that might not be there, but the echoes of what's happened are still going to be uh, impacting the region. So I think it's objectively true, uh, from my experience it is, that Florida as a, as a state, all the municipalities and counties within, uh, we are not winning uh, competitive grants at the level uh, proportionate to our population, like say New York or California is. So I think one of the things that needs to happen is much more collaboration, regional thinking, uh, even you know, multi-regional thinking. But I kind of wanted to hear what do you think needs to happen so that Florida can start winning competitive grants, uh, not just emergency response and, and niche things, but competitive grants for projects? Because I don't think it's lack of ideas. But thank you. Uh, it's, it's alignment. I mean, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we see, and, and I think in this recovery effort as well, is that it's, it's, it's almost overwhelming how many different organizations, people, programs are there to support. Um, you know, similarly, when we're going after and we're talking about these competitive grant opportunities, demonstrating that alignment, the municipal, the county, the regional, the state, education, you know, government, uh, you, having those talking to each other, having them actually on the same page, writing those letters of support um, is critical. I mean, they seem like a softer touch, but they're, they're such an important touch. And we receive uh, grant applications from communities all over the state all the time. We're part of the review process for some of the state's programs. And it is incredibly rare that that, that vision of the alignment is actually highlighted uh, and part of the grant application. Um, so I just think that's a really critical part of, of what we do. To so the part about, um, you know, points of contact and who's going to run things. Everyone needs a quarterback, right? So I just want to point out my first round draft pick is Greg. 
Um, however, you need an entire team. And so put to, you know, keep in mind, what are those organizations and who are those people that you need to put together as part of that project team, as part of that grant application team? And having that alignment as early and as consistently as you can ultimately is going to lead to competitive uh, and hopefully winning grant applications. And let me add, echo to what Destin, Destin said. Partnerships are really important. And that means when you're putting a grant application together, whether it's to HUD or EDA or USDA, we want to know how those partners are coming together. Now, everybody, I did lots of grants for many, many years. You can, you can send a form letter out and have everybody sign it. That's not what we want. We want to know if you've got a workforce, a career source partner, what is career source adding to the, to the project? What value add are they providing? So we're going to want them to say, we will train the people that are going to go into the incubator, for, for instance, right? And then the incubator provider is going to say, we are going to provide high-tech incubation training. We've got a model that works, blah, 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 and, and, and on down the list so that it's a true partnership. It's not just, here's, a, here's an application. Get the grant writer to, to pump it out and send it to us. We read these things every single day. And we can tell if the community has come together or if they've not come together, right? And we can tell a good project from one that just really hasn't seen the light of day, right? So partnerships and alignment really do matter. And that means, you know, you could have 10 different partners in a project. You could have, you could have Enterprise Florida providing um, uh, support. You could have your career source folks. You can have your, uh, your local so ser social service agencies. We want to know who is coming to the table to support that project because one group can't do it alone, right? So for all um, pulling together, we want to know that they're all rowing and they're heading in the same direction. And we want to know what value added that each of the partners is providing. And, and you know what? Challenge the executive director of the nonprofit to, to, to tell us what role they're going to play. And we don't, we don't necessarily need a financial contribution, even if it's technical assistance or s in some other method of support. That's really going to be, that's going to go a long way to making a competitive application. So just, just a little grant tip there. Find a way to get disqualified quickly, too. Um, I mean, no one likes wasting time. So, you know, Greg and I go back a little bit, and, um, you know, there was a period of time where he probably got a little annoyed with me because I just threw spaghetti at the wall. I'll be like, I got all these ideas. What can you pay for? Um, and it really helped to kind of cut through a lot of the noise and different things to really refine some of that ideation into a fundable project. Um, so get disqualified quickly if you can, so that you can pivot and focus on something that is, you know, a higher potential. I would just would like to add as well, um, on November the 17th, um, we are hosting a regional grants workshop. And so this was a uh, project that we worked on in coordination uh, with USDA Rural Development, as well as many of our other RSF partners. So there is going to be partners from HUD, USDA, EDA, FEMA will also be present. It's a virtual workshop. Um, again, I will send out the flyer. I'll send, share it with Thank you, you, Greg. Thanks, Daniel. Um, but it's November 17th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time, and it will provide some information on how to apply uh, uh, for those federal grants, how to locate federal funding opportunities, <coughs> um, ways in which you can then manage that grant. And so it provides some helpful recommendations that you consider can consider as you're developing your proposal. So this is a resource maybe that you can share with your networks, and I'll be happy to share it with Greg so he can share it with those of you that are attending today. I just want to overemphasize and beat a dead horse here. If you're talking about projects, you, commissioners, you've noted that there's a need for workforce housing. Now's the time to ramp up that process of looking at what your needs are. I don't speak about CDBGDR dollars. It's just not something I do. But I will say there is likely going to be a supplemental appropriation for disaster dollars, right? I mean, this is a major disaster. So there will be dollars out there for recovery projects, which would include housing, particularly low and moderate income housing. So now is the time, to echo um, what our friends are saying here, now is the time to look at that planning process and what your needs are and what are some of the resources that you have at your disposal here. For example, county property or 
you know, munis local municipal property that could support housing should there be a supplemental appropriation. And I'll just add to what Brandon and, and Destin were saying, and my, my good friend Jay Barnett's here. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, have a discussion with each, each and every one of us because, uh, like Destin said, we want good projects to come out of this, right? We're looking at this as an opportunity to help recovery in a really solid way. So have a conversation. And, and at the end of the day, we want good projects to come out of this process. And so uh, if that takes a half hour or hour conversation, it's worth our time. And, and, if a pro and if we can't do a project, my job is to tell you that's just not part of EDA's mission. And you've got to find another funding source, like I, I told Destin on a couple of occasions. And that's fine. That's just what we do, right? So I mean, again, it's, it's worthwhile to have that conversation early. And um, uh, we want good projects to come uh, to, come to us. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's going to be a disaster supplemental. But like my friend said, I, I presume there probably will be. And, and at that point, um, w at least from EDA's standpoint, uh, when a notice of funding opportunity is issued, my phone is going to be ringing off the hook, which means you've got to get your projects in, you've got to get your ducks in a row, so to speak, right? So start the planning and discussions now. <laughs> because four months after the NOFO is out, or five months out, it's going to be stale. And what EDA works on a continuous basis, so we, we review and obligate grants as we review them. So that money is going, to be, is, is going to be available for a short amount of time. So that's why it's important to have these um, projects in your minds, fleshed out, scopes of work, budgets, partnerships, alignment, all thought out so that Mel and I can have a really robust discussion or, or Destin and I can have a robust discussion about, hey, how can EDA help Enterprise Florida do X, Y, or Z, right? So. Question for you on that: Is the application and process different under a disaster supplement, or it, it, it's no? It's not really different. Just the funding level is different, and the the instructions in terms of the notice of funding opportunity are, are slightly different. But we don't create a we don't create a new program. What we do is we amp up an existing program. So once that sup, if that supplemental is awarded, we we put it into uh, an existing program, and we're ready to go. That application. You can find it. You can look at it. Yeah. You can build it. Fill it out. That NOFO hits, turn it in that day. That'd be my recommendation. Um, that might not be entirely possible, but aiming as close to that as possible would be my recommendation because those are going to be highly competitive dollars. Um, and so don't wait until the notice comes out to start filling out and completing an application. You might already be too late in that instance. Something to keep in mind, a lot of agencies are doing waivers right now and opening up funds that haven't been available to certain populations. So stay abreast of what agencies are doing waivers and extending deadlines, et cetera, because that'll open up some opportunities that weren't there before. OK, anything more from anyone on any of these subjects we've covered up until now? Workforce housing, um, I think we've been over some broadband, we've been over application processes and funding mechanisms and how to align our asks. And we've talked about local enterprise and how do we shift all of these things. What municipalities still have questions that are not Northport? I want to make sure that our neighbors are getting a fair shot at this. Um, I saw several people have to leave. No doubt they've got lunch engagements. We do have Venice in the room. We've got Sarasota in the room. We've got City of Sarasota in the room. Manatee, Manatee County in the room still. Who among you wants to stand up? Yes, ma'am. Okay, go for it. Hi, good morning. Shay Barnett, Manatee County Government's Economic Development Division. Um, great to be here and great to be with all of you. We have actually been working with Greg over the past several months. He attends our weekly ESF 18 meetings. And um, sitting here, I, there is a representative from most of the agencies that are at that table in our weekly 
meeting and um, what an opportunity that is for Manatee County. And um, okay. okay, sorry about that. Um, but really appreciate the opportunity to sit with um, either with you or representatives from the agencies you represent on a weekly basis. We are working with Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council um, and supported the um, hiring of the resiliency coordinator and also with our public safety group um, working on our local reviewing our local mitigation strategies and searching out um, those shovel-ready projects that we can move forward. I think the thing that kind of keeps me awake, you know, feeling good about the resources that are here and the opportunities that are here, but looking at our economy in Manatee County, where we have that coastal tourism attraction, We've got our urban core, typical urban areas. And then I think um, with this disaster, certainly the rural areas came to the forefront. And, and maybe the need to pay some additional attention to those areas. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering though, in terms of an application that may come forward and thinking in terms of alignment, um, are, do we um, seek to align those three economies into one, or do we prioritize one and focus on that, or do we just leave that to the technical assistance that will come through? I'm, I'm just trying to understand how um, much preparation or how far into the thought process do we need to be when we look at those three very different, very specific economies? So not really a question, but just what's on my mind. That was really a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> that was a very good question. Um, gee, that's a very good question. And I and I would I would I'm gonna hand this off to my friends at the Regional Planning Council because I think these are the kinds of questions that the regional planning councils wrestle with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So one of the things they're gonna look at when you talk about aligning economies is, is the question of, are the economies similar, right? Do, are, they, are the bases similar? Do they, do they have similar industries and things like that? Are there projects that could be regional in nature that would support all three economies? Or are they, are they just very different? And I think that's a question that can be addressed to a certain extent, by the planning and the economic analysis, we haven't even talked about that. The Regional Planning Councils also have access to economic analysis software and planning. So that's another way to look at modeling your economy, right? And so, so definitely reach out to them because it, it's not an easy question to, to answer because the question is, there are projects which by definition are going to be regional, like you know, one county or one city in nature. But there are other projects which can certainly rise to the level of regional impact and, and regional cooperation. How that's going to happen is up to you all. I, I can't, see, I can't, I can only guide you to say have those discussions because we're not going to dictate to you that you should have a regional stormwater project or a regional housing workforce housing project or anything that, like that. All we can say is from a competitiveness standpoint, we want, at least from EDA standpoint, we want our projects to have as much impact as possible, right? So, again, putting putting Harry and um, and Brian on the spot there. Maybe you guys can can add a little bit of a uh, uh, little bit of color to that. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd agree. It's. <laughs> Yeah, obviously there's no, um, I don't know, there's no secret sauce, <laughs> I don't think, to, to, to getting a successful, successful project through other than being clear about, if, you, if you're presenting it regionally, um, which obviously we're a little bit biased towards regionalism at the Regional Planning Council, but if you're presenting it regionally, arguing for why, why, why is this economy similar and why should you 
uh, transcend the, the boundaries for, for that project. But yeah, otherwise, again, we'd have to talk specifically as, as we do, <laughs> but we, we will have to for that. So, thank you. And, and again, not to, not, to, not to belabor this point, but we know that I think the, the point was made earlier on that um, workforce flows. I know Destin can, can talk about this from his prior days at the EDC. We know, I mean, Florida, this is the usual case. You know, people leave their counties to, to work two counties down, one county down, three counties down. I mean, there's, there's lots of commuter flows that go on. So there, from, from a commute shed standpoint, we are connected. Right? We're connected regionally from that workforce mobility flow standpoint. Now, how that factors into a project, I'm not sure, but it, but it does happen every single day. And that's, that's just something to think about, right? So I'd encourage you to, to try to take a look at what, it's really easy for us to find what's different in our economies and in our industries and in our communities. Um, sometimes a little harder to find what's the common denominator. And I think that's, critical when we're looking at these types of projects. I mean, the region uh, is incredibly diverse and has a lot of different need. Um, so just real quickly, a, a, a example of how this was attempted before, and it was a Manatee-Sarasota joint project. The 26 West? 26 20, West. 26? I got the number right. 26 West uh, was one of those examples where we took a look across the region and said, you know, how can we do something that would be supportive across industry? Um, you know, if you did something that was for CNC machine operators and welders, well, for the, those manufacturers, that's a critical component. Um, what we ended up looking at was, was technology talent and understanding that that was something that was consumed, whether you're a manufacturer, life science, a, a tech company, financial or professional services, it was a talent base that was universally needed. So that was the common denominator that we had found. So that was the, the grant and the program that was pursued. Um, so now whether that is between a, a coastal hospitality tourism based, a urban core and a rural, I don't know what that common denom denominator is, um, but those make for much more compelling projects when we can demonstrate that we're cutting across some of what might be considered traditional divides uh, to benefit the broader economy. Hey, Greg, when you come out, you would like better uh, awardees be good examples of, of just that blending of mixed economies. Examples you can share? Uh, yeah, one of the um, under the auspices of the American uh, Rescue Plan Act, uh, EDA launched a Build Back um, Better Regional Challenge, and we we essentially uh, went across the country and we invited folks to um, to tell us what clusters make sense on a regional basis in their communities, right? But by cluster, I mean industry cluster, whether it's tourism, whether it's automotive technology. Um, in, in the case of Florida, Florida won, or Osceola County won uh, a large project from EDA to support the research and development of the semiconductor industry sector. Uh, they have a facility at Bridge uh, in Kissimmee. Uh, that, that facility was underutilized. Uh, and that I had had previous discussions with them to bring um, semiconductor manu uh, machines to, to bear. Uh, we couldn't fund it under our regular program, um, but under the Build Back Better program, which was a billion dollar program, we provided a grant um, through five different, uh, five di actually five different projects for about $57 million um, to enhance the facility, to do workforce training. Um, we're going to stand up an industry cluster um, uh, Best management practices. Uh, we're going to work with um, uh, your your the, the EDO um, in in Orlando Orlando Economic Partnership, um, Valencia College, USF. Again, that's that what they did is they brought together a broad based a partnership of private, public, and ac academic partners, uh, and they're going to build incubators. I mean, they're going to build um, semiconductors, and not just any old. Semiconductor, this is called advanced packaging, and I don't know enough to get into the whole minutia of advanced packaging, but essentially it's taking chips, putting them together, and making them stronger, faster, more resilient for military, um, advanced aerospace, and medical um, applications. So it's a growing market, growing niche market in, um, uh, in the world, and it's uh, projected to, about, to be about, what, 50% of the market in another 
five, 10 years. So it's a huge, huge market opportunity. And, and Osceola County, little Osceola County, um, they, they took the initiative, they bought 500 acres of land and they're gonna um, create a technology park. So they did this early on thinking and they set, um, they, they made some investments. And again, they made investments in their own community and we just helped nudge them over the, uh, over the, over the hurdle. So that's just another example of what can be done if you bring together a wide ranging partnership of, of um, interested parties because you, everything, semiconductors power everything. And it, and it has national implications and, and, and reshoring. It's a whole array of issues that this taught on. Absolutely. Anybody want to tag on to that comment or two? Do I, did I miss somebody? Oh, Mark. I just wanted to mention that um, we try to work through those issues during the SEDS process and identifying the regional projects, the important the vital projects. And we recognize that things change quickly. We update that document every year. But also, you should be aware that the regional planning councils don't, they work together. And we oftentimes work across borders. I'm working on a, a project now with Manatee County including Manatee County, that they asked to be involved in. It has to do with food insecurity. So in Central Florida is working on transportation issues with two of the Henry and Glades County in my district. So we, we get together like every couple of weeks, all 10 regional planning council, and share projects and ideas and work through these issues. So that's another reason why it's important to keep, to collaborate with your regional planning councils so we can keep everybody in the loop on what's going on. Thank you. Anybody else? Any different topics, new topics that we can start engaging in? There's Bill Gunnan. Raise your hand, Bill Gunnan. Bill, tell 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 our tell our audience who you are. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Northport. By the way, I'm Bill Gunning with the Northport Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, these topics are great, and but the problem is a lot of these topics we're talking about going future planning and everything else. Disaster. People want to get back to normalcy as soon as possible, and the things we're seeing and what needs to be done as many a times as far as in order to get back to recovery, relief, is. The demand is much higher than the ability to meet the demands, whether it be the service out there to provide the service, whether it be the products to get the products done into here. Um, there got to be means of uh, speeding up the process that people can get the service, the demand they need met, so that they can get back to normalcy. Um, there's too much of I've seen that people are coming to our chamber office. Do you have somebody? Do you have somebody? Yeah, but they're six months booked out. There's not enough service providers during a disaster. It's a way of bringing outside service providers to help get recovered as fast as possible. It's the old saying in business, time is money. And when you're shut down and you don't have the products or the service to get back up normalcy, it's costing money, costing jobs. Um, another issue, if you don't mind, is I would imagine federally, state, something could be assistance. A lot of things we're hearing now in delay of people getting back to work and business are legal issues between a tenant and a landlord, whether it be each side. People are stuck now. They can't get back because there's issues delaying the ability to get back to normal. And then finally, I'll stop on this. Well, I got two more because I'm going to bring somebody else into this. Is people were rattled by the storm. They're emotionally rattled. They still aren't. Counseling services would be great to have in a community with a disaster that would come in and provide a service because people are really shaken up by this and it's affecting going home and at work. It'd be great to see mobilization of counseling opportunities to help people for that service. The last thing I like to do is, and I understand government, government takes a little while sometimes. In a disaster, you'll see the coming together of local people, business organizations to meet the needs right away. Um, we had that with, with Barbara United Way and other groups that worked together to provide the immediate needs that the community needed 
Wish there was some way, though, these people like those organizations that are doing this are taking this out of their own pocket. And they were devastated and hit by the storm also. If the government realizes that it's going to take a little while to get the services there, reach out to the local community. There are groups that want to take action now and can take action now. Help support them so they can do that. As a follow-up, uh, Phil Stokes, uh, in about two days, I plan on being on the Northport Commission. And the reason uh, I want to follow up on Bill's comment is that um, my concern is there's an awful lot of brick and mortar businesses. Commissioner Langdon mentioned home-based businesses. It's a lot of folks, who, as Bill said, can't get back into their locations, who have equipment that are ruined. Uh, they need help financially, and they ask us, what do we do? Are there programs out there? That's my question. Other than the traditional small business assistance, what is there that might be available for our small businesses here, small and mid-sized businesses in Northport, to help get them back on their feet? Not six months, 12 months, five years, 10 years from now, but now, within the next couple of months, Hi, Liz Miller with DEO. Are you familiar with um, the Emergency Small Business Bridge Loan Program? <coughs> so it is available for small businesses that employ two to 100 um, for up to $50,000. And we are getting um, applications in 24 hours a day, um, and we're getting those turned around pretty quickly. So if you do have any um, businesses, please feel free to reach out um, on our website. The application process is really fairly simple. <clears throat> if you're running into situations where maybe they don't have the technology, right, or the internet, um, we have a lot of partners in the room that are willing to help. I know um, Career Source is set up um, to assist. I know our um, SBDCs are set up to help assist. So, you know, there are a lot of partners that are able to try and help some of these small businesses get some of this emergency funding. So here's an answer you might not like. Um, it, it takes time, and part of the time is the understanding. You know, so in the media aftermath, there's the um, all these different assessments and surveys that are out there so that we can understand the need. One of the observations I've had since Ian has come through, there's so much help out there, it is really struggling to aim in the right direction. Um, there's a lot of need across a lot of swath of states. So Southwest Florida clearly took you know, the brunt and the direct hit. But you track that storm up through Central Florida and the flooding that's taken place across the state. There's so much need in so many places that they're struggling to identify where is the most immediate direct need. So in the most immediate term, that communication, having your business community participate in some of those you know, business damage assessment surveys and things of that nature, which DEO runs, that's going to help get the scale and scope and then to aim those resources in that way. So I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but that is a piece that I would certainly encourage because there's a lot of help out there. It's struggling to, to go to where it's most needed because of a lack of understanding and because of the breadth of the problem. Uh, so any communication, that's where the chambers have been great partners. That's where the economic development organizations have all been great partners to help define the need. Anecdotally, of course, I mean, we all know. I mean, Northport, Southwest Florida is so greatly effect, affected, but where, how, and, and, the, and the direction of support is something that is an iterative process. So the more loudly and the more participants we have in defining that, the faster that those resources are going to get aimed in the right direction and arrive at the businesses. Aaron. Hi, um, my name is Erin Silk from the EDC of Sarasota County. Dustin, you know, to your point, very good point. Um, what keeps me up at night, Jay, um, is that our businesses have struggled to complete that damage assessment survey. You know, obviously, for a long time, um, power, internet connectivity, cell phone service was very much an issue. And quite frankly, a lot of the businesses are just trying to get back up and running today. Um, so what keeps me up at night is maybe an underrepresentation of the business need for Sarasota County. Um, 
As of this morning, of the 26,000 registered businesses in Sarasota County, 304 have completed that damage assessment survey. So we're not even scratching the surface of what that damage is. Um, you know, we it's not a question, I'm just putting it out for, for awareness purposes as we all continue to move forward. Um, but under Rob's leadership with Sarasota County, um, we began meeting weekly, very quickly after the hurricane. Um, all of the economic development organizations, the chambers in the, the county, and we're talking about the damage assessment survey. We've together, we've emailed 100% of the businesses. The EDC is doing a media campaign to get the word out on the importance. Um, the city of Northport has called all 1,000 businesses. The EDC and the staff from Career Source Suncoast have now reached out to over 1,000 businesses for the rest of the county. So. We're working diligently to get the word out about that survey. I'd encourage everybody in the room here to also help get that word out because it's going to be very important. Um, but it it does um, create a little anxiety for me that there is going to be business damage that's going to go unreported. I'll use that launch pad to just put my 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 uh, imprimatur on it as well to say. I don't know anybody who's not pushing this from the chambers to the cities. Everybody is pushing. Please fill the survey out. And we've offered to do it for them. We send them places if they can't have it done. But we continue to push the message. Everybody in this room should be pushing the, pushing the message. And if we can't get a good assessment, we can't get the funding that's so um, desperately needed, uh, the, just to brag on Northport for a second, not only we, did we do a call center and push out, uh, you know, a thousand plus phone calls in a call center, uh, we've done follow-up phone calls, we've done visits, and now we just did a mass mailing. I don't know what that was, over 1,200, 1,500 mass mailing pieces that went out with very specific information. So we are continuing to drive the message, everybody who works in here in the way of chamber Chambers, Kathy uh, Laner over there in Venice, I know they're doing the same thing. We're all working toward that end. So it's just apparently not enough. And I mean, if we had a magic bullet, we'd do something. But we're, we're sort of going, why, why are people not responding to it? We just don't know the answer. Commissioner Luke. I mean, it, it, on it's, that questionnaire, is there a yes, place where yes. they can mark that they don't need help, there's no damage or anything? Yes, so there that, is that information that's on the survey. Okay, and it can They take a survey. It's a multi-question kind of thing. Yeah. If you have that where they can zap out of it because they don't need help or that, it might change your figures. But whether you do or don't need help. I think at, my understanding it. is they're just, they're, they're tallying the total number that they receive, the total number of surveys, and that's how we know what we're getting. So if people, people are simply not sending them back, and they are online, so, you know. Other questions or comments about how we're trying to reach businesses? That's a really good question and a good one. Uh, but other items that fall in that general, hey, we need more help with our business infrastructure kind of thing. Anybody else have anything they will comment on? Uh, are there other questions now? I, I have one that hasn't been asked yet, and I haven't seen anybody. And unfortunately, Erin Dugan left. I think she had a lunch to go to. But if there are no other questions, I want to pose one in the way of tourism, very specifically falls on the the heels of what Che was talking about, but we've all experienced in this area huge um, hit to our local economy for tourism. That includes damage to our, po our parks and our natural resource areas. So I am of interest in knowing how do we in particular, and I don't see our <coughs> parks director here either, but if there's somebody who can help me with this question, um, I I'm wondering what we can do to bring back a historic park site and uh, I know that we're not the Lone Rangers. There are others who've been uh, impacted along that way as well. Mm -hmm. 
Nobody who can help me with that question. Wow. Please tell us who you are and who you represent. Uh, Willis Gaynor with the U.S. Department of Interior. Yes, you're the you're the one. I think I'm the one. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we work closely with the National Park Service, and they do have resources and technical assistance available to bring in to address specific issues like that. We work with disasters in other states where we uh, <coughs> planned and helped to recover and uh, restore resiliency to uh, historic structures. As a matter of fact, um, this coming Wednesday, we're going to be down at Sanibel Island looking at their uh, historic lighthouse and the damage that occurred there and help them with planning for recovery of that. Well, will you stop on the way down or stop on the way back and go. come right. talk to <laughs> us? That would be really good. We'll try to do that. Okay, Thanks. thank you, sir. Anybody else with questions on any subject whatsoever that this body can address? We'll go for it. Um, I, I am not aware. Oh, no, we need for you to get it in the microphone. Um, so, yeah, when we talk workforce, I'm going back to workforce and that's workforce fine. housing, and since that's our um, major deal here. Uh, the, the other issue besides housing, of course, is transportation. And I'm not sh we haven't addressed it today. Uh, is there any organization here that addresses when we speak to our job seekers or employers, they're all talking about, besides the fact that I don't have a place to live, I can't get to work. Uh, so the buses, the lines, uh, we're trying to find for them work where it's close to their home. We have to go and look at the bus lines and see where is it that they're going to be able to take a bus from A to Z. Sometimes they need to be two hours ahead of time just to get to work if they're taking the bus. So again, anybody that can, I guess you can address it. Rob Lewis is the answer man from the yes. county. Yes, thank you, Rob. How many steps have you put in? <laughs> thank you for that question. Uh, we at the county embarked on a new business model for transportation about a year and a half ago. An element of that includes a mobility on demand service that can help in some circumstances people get from their home, from their curb, to either a transit hub or a bus line. So if you give me your card afterwards, I'll make sure that we get you in direct connection with our transit director. Rob, correct me, there's some there's some literature to that effect, right, that we could send over to Career Source or Yes, we'll we'll to, ensure that that's happening. Thank you, excellent. Surely you are not out of questions. This yeah, good. Never, never, never without a question. <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, we, we've talked, there are so many agencies involved, there's so much help, um, and yet we've come down to what Aaron was talking about, which was we can't, and, and, and for you as well, you know, uh, we can't even get the answers back to the surveys. And that was a problem during the pandemic. People are somewhat tired of surveys. That's, that, that's really the answer to the question. Um, but the, the honest answer is always communication. And Greg was, and, and you were talking about uh, if you don't prepare now to do something later, you'll be too late to get it done. It's time for everybody to talk to each other and, and, and make sure that you always at least contact the people in the area that you're in so they can talk to the people in the area that, they're, that, that you're not in. Um, the planning councils for one thing, the elected bodies for another. Uh, the, the the state level government, which is there, always help up to the federal level, and we have a lot of things to do and a lot of places to go and a lot of help that's needed. But I have this fear that we'll all leave and all work on getting our own little thing, and at the end we'll be a regional failure. This has to be a regional <laughs> effort in order to make this thing work. It can't be a local effort strictly. It's got to be regional. At the end of the day, it all comes back to the local governments, no doubt about that. But the, audit, the, the end game is to have the region get together and try and get with the federal government and the state government and try and make this state a stronger state, and regionally we can do that. 
So I hope when you leave here today, you think about the communication. <laughs> it's going to be from everybody within the region to the regional councils and wherever else you have to go. But the regional councils certainly are the first best step in order to try and resolve the issues that you may have. Thank you. Well, words well said. Hey there, my name is Kat. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. So I, I'm sorry. I saw a hand in the yeah. back before you. Do you want to respond to what he just said? Just, just a quick response. Okay, yeah, if sure. Possible. Go ahead. So my name is Preeti Shah, and I'm representing the community assistance recovery <coughs> function. I want to call out that I'm a part of a team. So if any of my team members that are not up here who want to say anything, please do so. So I, you know, I want to recognize our our recovery support function is maybe the most flexible, but very focused on trying to connect communities, specifically communities of concern that have lower capacity and higher vulnerability for uh, disaster recovery, right? So while we're in this room, and I'm going to recognize the awkward position that I'm in of being on this panel, where I'm here to answer questions, but I actually have a question really for you to think about. It's kind of calling out the same thing that this gentleman has brought up, is that we recognize that it needs to be coordination and the cities and the counties here that are represented, really grateful for the local officials that you know what your city and your county may need. But, you know, kind of colloquially, we all maybe have an understanding of, our, of a neighbor city or a neighbor county or a small community within your county that may be not represented. So this is the ask of if, if perhaps they are not able to come to the table themselves, our community assistance background is capacity building. You know, we are funded by FEMA specifically to reach out to communities of concern that have low capacity. Understanding that as, um, you know, city commissioners and city local officials, your plate is already quite full for regular steady state. Adding on the disaster response layer is, I can understand, probably be a challenge, you know. So grateful that you're here. I'll think about recovery. If you recognize other smaller communities rural communities or even not rural, high urban communities that may not be able to come to the table just because of capacity. These are these are communities that we're interested to hopefully talk to. So that's my ask. If you have someone in your mind that you're thinking of or or you can put us in contact with any of the you know local cities or counties that are around you that may are maybe are not represented and do not have the capacity for representation, that's um, who we'd love to also kind of talk and coordinate with and Definitely um, calling out the regional planning councils um, and everyone up here reiterating the sort of emphasis on collaborating. And we just thought we'd kind of put the hand out to see uh, we can bring them in more than they come into the table. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. So we got Kathy Laner from okay. Venice Chamber. Kathy Laner from the Venice Area Chamber of Commerce. You mentioned collaborating. Well, I do have to give props to our, um, the county, Sarasota County, and to the city of Venice. They both stepped up when it came to our businesses, when it came to fast-tracking any type of permits that needed to be done. I've talked to many contractors who were thrilled with the process. I know we're concerned about the DEO survey, so I guess I want to ask, what's the normal percentage for the return? It's been South Sarasota County that was hit the hardest. So if you take our 26,000 businesses in the county and you go Venice South, we're probably not even, I know Venice, my zip codes that are in, in our area are about six, 7,000 businesses. Northport saying 1,000. Inglewood, very slim because most of it's in Charlotte County. So are we talking 10,000 businesses with a 350 survey return? What is that number? because we have been beating a dead horse, getting it out to everybody. And so are we wasting time doing that? Or is there something else we could be doing to get those numbers? Where do we stand in the average from DEO? Um, <clears throat> so that's a great question and that I don't have the answer to. I'm certainly um, prepared to go back and, and try to find that, that answer. So are we looking at so are you looking at percentages like within your county or within your municipalities, you know, like how exactly, because I think that we're probably tracking by county. Um, I would track by businesses. Our county has many municipalities. When Northport, 
and the city of Venice were probably the two biggest municipalities. The other ones north of Clark Road were really not affected by the storm. So again, I was going by the number of businesses from that area down. And then just to see where we are, so that if we're, if we're actually tracking well, now maybe our focus needs to shift on something else to help get the funds here instead of the information out to, to you. If we're doing well and we have those numbers, now how do we get that access to the money? Great question. Thank you. Anybody else? Did I see another hand? I did. Okay. Good afternoon. Kind of have an out of the box question. My name is Felipe Colon. I'm a trustee at New College of Florida over in Sarasota. How are you, Mel? Nice to see you. Good, good to see you too. Um, wanted to ask about resiliency and hardening for our colleges and universities. I know we have several in our community. Um, New College has a unique problem where we have a Bayfront campus. We also have a not so unique problem. We are behind in deferred maintenance. Almost every college and university in the state is behind by tens of millions of dollars in maintenance of their buildings. So because we're behind in the maintenance of the buildings and the fact that there are often political issues that make it difficult for us to keep um, a lot of surplus in our budgets every year, it, it's difficult for us to plan for resiliency and to make sure that when these disasters do happen, we're in a, a good, competent position to recover quickly and maintain the safety of our students and, and staffs. So I wanted to uh, ask, we have a Board of Governors meeting tomorrow, actually, in Tampa. Um, if there are any directions that you could point us into that we could um, better address this problem in the future going forward before the next disaster happens. Thank you. Something we've seen in other states. Now, USDA probably can't go into your territory, but we have seen alternative methods of financing or capital stack where they've utilized the foundation and used leases, and they went other directions for their capital money and then leased the property back to the Board of Governors. So look at alternative methods of financing. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have some questions. Greg, do you have anything more you want to say? Because I'm going to give some direction here if we're all done. Looks like we're pretty well talked out. I do want to thank our directors from the city of Northport who have managed to stick with us through all this. I see my planners. I see our um, public works people, our utilities people, our, our police and fire, our media, our assistant city managers have been wandering in and out, our legislative analysts. They are all part and parcel of how we have to operate here in the city, of course. And I want to give them one last opportunity to pitch something for Northport if you have anything. So this would be the last moment because then we're going to break for lunch and who knows what will happen after that. <laughs> Anybody, any of our staff who are just dying to ask a question? Have we hit them all? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then let's let me. Yeah, please do. As we started off this uh, this discussion today by saying this is an initial discussion, we are going to be rolling out other regional workshops uh, as as we're planning them in partnership with our regional planning and local partners. So um, I will make you aware of all those other regional workshops that, that we'll be um, scheduling uh, in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. So you'll have another kick at the can uh, in the future. So don't think this is the only time that you might see our lovely faces. <laughs> well, we might, uh, we might, might uh, be around the corner uh, in, in, uh, later this month and uh, possibly early December. Thank you, Greg. I think Destin had one more closing remark. Actually, it's a, it's a question. Um, I just I didn't want us to, to leave this without asking what, what I, at least in my head, is a pretty big one. Uh, we've talked a lot about regionalism. Um, we have a lot of different communities, a lot of different interests, a lot of different opportunities, a lot of different needs. How many bites of the apple and how big of those bites can we take? You know, I mean, are we talking, if we're going to go to the EDA, is, is it need to be one regional proposal? Can it handle, I mean, I know there's no hard and fast, right? Yeah. But I just want to start setting some expectation for, like, what would be a reasonable amount of requests? What is the type, typical funding amounts of these requests so that we can kind of right-size some of the thoughts? So you've and given us a terrible question for him. I couldn't help but set him up for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Destin, for setting me up on that. Um, so just to give you some perspective, um, normal, normal funding, when we do construction projects on a 50% basis, 
our average grant size is about one and a half million to two. So that translates to about a three to four, maybe to a $5 million project. If we get a disaster supplemental, those grant caps come off. Now, we don't have all the money in the world. N nobody does. Uh, we're going to have limited resources. Um, there really, it really is no typical project size, but, but we can do projects that are bigger than the three to five million. So we have done, after Hurricane Irma, uh, the gentleman from New College, um, uh, Florida Keys College came to us. Uh, their, their Key West facility uh, was, was largely uh, damaged because of Hurricane Irma. And they wanted to create a satellite facility uh, in Marathon and to, to also do some more workforce training with respect to up and coming uh, industry sectors that the Keys might have some relative advantage in. So uh, we put together, uh, they put together a $16 million ask for EDA and they put in $4 million. So we built a, we're building a $20 million um, satellite facility for, I think it's called College of the Florida Keys now. It used to be called Florida Keys College. But that's just an example of, of a large project that we've done. Um, but, but I would say anywhere from, you know, three to four to five, ten million dollars, possibly. But again, it's going to depend on, first off, whether there is a disaster supplemental and what those amounts are. I'm looking at my friend from HUD, so we have no idea what that could be. Could be large, could be small, could be anywhere in between. But uh, we will be able to accommodate um, as much as we can. We work very quickly. I will, I will tell you this. We will, we will disperse all available funds that we have within probably a year. So that's the timeline. We work very fast. So um, start those discussions right now. Come to, come to the other regional workshop and um, be ready to have those offline discussions. Thank you very much. And we are about 25 minutes ahead of schedule, which is amazing. <laughs> um, I do want to give you a big, great big hug, a virtual hug from over here to you for your time, your energy, your travel, your thoughtfulness in responding to all of these questions. Um, many of you are friends to us already, but those of you who have not made your way to the friendship column, I think that is short-lived. So uh, we appreciate our commissioners and the, their work, giving up their workshop time to share with others. So appreciative. And I want to ask if you have not signed in to our sign-in sheets that are just right in front of the elevators, please take the time to do that. We want to compile that so that we can share that with anybody who wants it, and particularly those people who will be potentially interacting with you. I know on behalf of city manager, myself, uh, we're grateful to your being here, and we hope for very positive outcomes in the future. You are invited to stay for lunch. It's nothing splendid because this is, we're on a government budget, right? And uh, so nothing big, but it is an opportunity to network a little bit longer, and we do encourage you to stay. We're going to be in room 244, which is just if you exit, it'll be to your left, and you'll smell the food probably. So follow your leaders, and um, it was wonderful to have everyone here. Thank you for all your participation. Yes, sir. You want to send us a note, we'll be glad to send it out for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy to do it. I didn't break for lunch. I'm going to. I'm trying to figure something out here. 108 would be a half an hour. Is that good? All right. We still got to finish up a meeting too today. We got one in a partial. It's fine. One fifteen. One fifteen.
this pack is wrong. This pack is wrong. This one's wrong? It's wrong. No, that one's wrong. This is wrong. Right here. It's 1239. We had time change yesterday. That one's wrong. That one's an hour fast. I couldn't, I didn't know which one was right. No, it wasn't. It is. Gotcha. 150, is that? Or no, that's a half hour, isn't it? One thirty. Be back at one thirty.
It's 1.30, everybody's here. Uh, Commissioner Langdon's right around the corner and uh, Commissioner Luke will be right back shortly. We are going back to general business 22-3606. Um, I do believe staff has been working on this and has a proposal to uh, go ahead and update us on what he's been working on for our legislative priorities. Okay, Todd Miles, legislative analyst. Thank you. So I took the liberty, uh, based on the conversation that was had earlier in the meeting, of coming up with a little language that I think hopefully encapsulates the uh, consensus that you all had. So uh, if I can just review that briefly with you, and if there's general agreement on it, then I think this will pretty much be wrapped up. Absolutely, sir. Okay. So on the le state legislative priorities, um, <clears throat> Under infrastructure, um, we had water quality improvements, uh, the priority of providing septic to sewer conversion incentives, testing and resiliency. Um, we didn't have anything there about stormwater management. Do we want to add anything in view of the um, effects of the hurricane to add stormwater management in addition to water quality improvements? Yes. I would be a yes unless you're going to put in disaster recovery as another topic, and I would put that under that. Well, right. I mean, you know, it fits in two different places. One was just water quality. It seemed like it was really a broader water issue. It was water management, too. But you're right. If there's a disaster recovery subheading, it can be dealt with that way, too. It's a question of how you want to package it, in effect. Right, yeah. I'm consensus on the board, would I would say yes with stormwater management, absolutely. Add that under infrastructure? Uh, under water Disaster. Recovery. Under disaster recovery? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I have a comment about that, where it really should be, stormwater management should be ongoing, not just related. When we had disasters because of stormwater improvements that we desperately need, uh, I shouldn't say desperately, I'm sorry, but we, we could use. So uh, that's why I'm, it shouldn't just be, it shouldn't, should not be just focused on when there's a disaster, but ongoing. Well, it's also, in, in my opinion, disaster and recovery is preparing <clears throat> for a disaster, not afterwards. The resiliency aspect. Yeah. It's still, you're preparing for a that disaster by having good storm water management. All right, but I was thinking in terms of, it doesn't have to be an actual disaster or declared a disaster for us to, we've had flooding, this is not a disaster. It's still storm water management concerns that we've right, had. No, I understand what, where you're leaning. Right. I'm, I just incorporated it. I'm just thinking that you put that in flood. that little little package and it's, it's gonna be put into the disaster bucket and not if this is ongoing, we've had flooding concerns all along just because of where we're located. Well, right. so to go that way, we had several bullets under infrastructure and where it says water quality improvements, we could say water quality and stormwater management improvements. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I, I think it's an infrastructure. Stormwater management to me is infrastructure. Um, if we put it as water quality, comma, stormwater management, comma, improvement, uh, providing septic and sewer conversion initiatives. There's like three different things in there um, and separating it with the commas and the and. That way then to Commissioner White's point, it's not just disaster recovery. This is infrastructure. Stormwater is infrastructure. Yeah, I would, I would go for that. I, I have no problem adding them all in you know, everything that deals with that water, including the storm water. But if you're going to have another title called disaster <coughs> recovery, I would definitely want it listed again. Well, what's your feeling about having a separate title for disaster recovery? Well, do you want to get a consensus to, to do the water quality <coughs> improvements Stormwater management and providing <clears throat> septic to sewer conversion incentives, testing and resiliency. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. fine. We can get a consensus on that. 
Commissioner McDowell? Yes. Commissioner White? Yes. I'm a yes. yes. Vice Mayor and yes. Commissioner Luke. All right. Okay, that's done. Um, under affordable housing, I think the feeling, uh, general feeling was language to the effect supports all initiatives and incentives to support affordable housing projects, including use of the Sadowski Fund for local housing assistance as intended and approved by statewide voters and property insurance industry reform. Yep, I think you got that on what we were saying earlier. Yeah, but I don't think insurance reform really is part of affordable housing. I think it's a it's its own little thing. Well, I mean, you know, it is related because you can't get mortgage financing unless you have adequate property insurance. Um, I, I see it tied together. I, I see it tied mm -hmm. in too. I think they are kind of, especially someone who's struggling. To achieve affordable housing, that property insurance premium going up is going to be a major impediment, exactly. perhaps, to getting affordable housing. So they are, I could see them related. All right. Concede. Consensus on that? Commissioner can, McDowell? Can you repeat can I read that back? Yes, okay. please. Under the subheading affordable housing, supports all initiatives and incentives to support affordable housing projects, including use of the Sadowski Fund for local housing assistance as intended and approved by statewide voters and property insurance industry reform. I'm a yes, but just double check grammar. That, that <laughs> second one is the second bullet point, correct? Um, I can do it in two bullets, yeah. I had to do a semicolon, but I can, yep. I would two do two there. bullet points. Okay. Commissioner White? This is for the state. We're still on the state, right? State, yeah. Yeah, and that would be in a new category, affordable housing, right? Yes. It's there. Yep. It's yeah. there. It's just this filling in the substance under. Oh, that. I was looking at, at this. And it's already old. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at my word outline that was attached to it. But it would be new. But yes, I'm fine. Yes. Yes. And Commissioner Yes. White. All right. Okay. Um, I added Suncoast Technical College as a new subheading. And the statement supports continued funding to ensure all facility and growing student population needs are fully met. I think, wasn't that your suggestion? I think it was fully funding because I think the issue in the past has been they received right. a percentage of what they asked for. So the, the, the fully was in the first part. Uh, let, me, let me pull it up again. Uh, Um, it was, so it's a continued support to ensure fully funding? Let, let me read this again, and I, if you need to read it again. Mine said support the fully funding of the Suncoast Technical College to ensure their facility and growing student population needs are met. Correct. It's, it's the, they've been shorted on some of their funding. And then as they also want to grow their campus, that also ties back to their funding requests. Okay. Can I read it again? Supports continued full funding to ensure all facility and growing student population needs are met. You need to remove the word continue. continue because they've never they've done never it. They've never got it. <laughs> okay. Support fully funding. Right. Got it. I'm a yes. Commissioner White. Yes. I'm a yes. Yes. It's good. Yes. Okay. Then for the state, the only open item perhaps is whether you want to add a subheading for disaster recovery or not. Can I pose a question before you go to that one? Because there, I have a category called water quality that is pretty much just repeating what was done and stated under infrastructure. So I think you could actually eliminate the water quality bullet point. I agree. Catch. Okay. Done. Commissioner White. Yeah. That's good. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. So we're back to disaster. And what was recovery. the uh, oh, disaster recovery? Yep. 
I think in light of the hurricane, we should add one. I agree. And if I could make a few suggestions, Mayor, um, that we have insurance reform. I know we talked about it in the affordable housing, but insurance reform is not just to be able to afford insurance. The insurance reform has reared its ugly head and put so many constraints mm -hmm. and so many unknowns on the policy holders and policies themselves um, that they need to have reform. And that also then falls in with tort reform um, because of the, the, the attorneys. All the roofing litigation. Yeah, all, mm -hmm. all the different litigations that are coming about, the uh, assignment of benefits, the, it, it's, the, what is it, the, they're hiring um, public adjusters. Public adjusters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people are acting in panic mode and not really understanding, I think, the full intent of what they're signing and what they're doing. And it just falls to the, the state needs to do reform for the insurance and for the litigation part of it. So... I'm not sure it's the insurance companies that are driving that Two market behavior. Two different things. Run it by me again, please. The insurance, because of the deductibles, there's like a 2%, a 5%, a, 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 a $500 deductible. All these deductibles, yes, it is the whole property owner's choice on the deductibles, but there are certain things that aren't covered or certain things that are covered. And... That is part of the reform that needs to take place at the insurance or them dropping people. The insurance companies are dropping people left and right. They're going bankrupt. There's, there's so many different caveats to insurance reform that really needs to be looked at. And I'm kind of lumping it all together. And then a separate part is the litigation reform, the tort reform. <laughs> Well, you can almost look at property insurance reform as a category unto itself. It's not necessarily disaster recovery, but it is a topic that was there before the storm, right. mm -hmm. and it's still with us. Maybe you want to isolate that under its own subheading. And yeah, like a couple of the bolts. same situation if a fire of course in their house or but something. But that's also a disaster to that person. No, to one person, but right. when you when you go disaster relief, it's usually community right. And right. thought of thought of that way. Part of the insurance reform does not rear its head until you have a disaster as right. opposed to one fire here and one loss there. It, it's because now you've got so many people that are bringing it all to light. Well, I, I like your suggestion, Mr. Miles. Yeah, I plan it out. You would then remove that from the affordable housing as a bullet point. And you would just have uh, insurance as its own separate. And yes, yeah. I think it makes more sense doing that way than adding it to uh, disaster recovery, even though disaster <coughs> does highlight it, but it was highlighted even before the disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it might be so. worth noting, though, that I, my understanding is the governor is going to call a special session of the legislature on this topic after the election day, but before the end of the year. So. These priorities are really targeting what happens when the session starts in January, right? Mm -hmm. This may be done by then. Not, I mean, it's not That's saying you shouldn't do it. I just That's want to make sure end. that, you know, the timing is I think the state intends to take this topic up pretty quickly. And I, um, for one, would like to have it on there. That way yeah. then we are showing them this is important to our city. Right. Mm -hmm. I understand the state's going to do it. We've heard that before. Been there, done that. Been down that road. <laughs> <laughs> Still traveling that road. <laughs> Okay, so we'd have a, a subheading property insurance industry reform? Yeah, in general. Right. Okay. I, I like that because, we, like it was mentioned, we were having problems. People were getting <coughs> cancellation notice, not even having a claim just because they were pulling out of the state. Yeah, have been there, done that Yes, one. that's why I was looking at you. Yeah, we went through that like three, four times yeah. the last few years. And then we had two policies, and then we had, it was a mess mm -hmm. for homeowners. So do you want to include a couple uh, bullets under that? Commissioner McDowell, I think you had sort of articulated a few sub-issues there. I'd, I would like to add a few, but 
I don't want it to be the primary focus. I think the primary focus is the heading insurance yeah. industry yeah. reform. I think that just sums it up because there are so many tentacles to insurance industry reform that if we just start isolating two or three of them, I don't want that to right. be the focus. That's in my opinion. I agree. I agree. That nothing uh -huh. has been done. So for us to, to make it clear, this is a priority. Get Let's start somewhere. Let's do something. Um, I, I would like just to leave yeah. it as, as So will this be sort of a general topic like home rule is? Just put property insurance and then just reform. Support, Supports reform industry to, reform. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yep. Everybody's good with that? Commissioner White? I'm good. Yep. Vice Mayor? Good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. We're all good with that. All right. I think that makes, uh, wraps up for the state part. Okay. Did we want to add something for tort reform? For that's the will of the board. So I'm, I'm good with I'm, what we've Yeah, got. I was good with yeah. the insurance. Okay. Okay, so just turning attention to the federal side. Um, same issue under infrastructure, or we have as a bullet water quality improvements. Do we want to add storm water management? As you can see, there's uh, some pretty hefty federal funding programs available for that type of thing. Our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, EDA, other funding. So do we want to amplify that one bullet under infrastructure? I do. Yeah, I would I would put it underneath there. Can I make a suggestion? Just copy what we have for the state and just put it under the federal under infrastructure and then we can remove the water quality under the federal infrastructure like we did on the state. I thought that's what he was doing. Was doing the same as what we did I for the state. Just want to I was hearing a little bit different. Okay, so we'll do the same thing on both sides. Yeah, that, that's what I thought you had said. I'm sorry. Yeah, so. Okay, that's easy. Uh, okay. Commissioner White, you good with that? Y yeah, I just wanted. Well, yes and no. Yes, I'm I'm good okay, with we're having. Yes, <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Now, now you can. Go okay, on. I wanted to throw something out there to see what what everybody thinks. Um, this this year, I really learned how much. Um, how important it was for us to get the, the ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And would like to have our legislators know that it's important that we cap, you know, we, we capture that, that, those funding opportunities when they, when they come along. Um, because none of our, unfortunately, representatives um, supported that. And, but we're, we're utilizing that money to do a lot of things. I, I think I would like to, to see what all of you think about that, that we, we have ARPA funds that bring in infrastructure to our 75 quadrants, and, and that's pretty much has started the whole movement with the, the hospital. But if we didn't get those funds, we would have to, we may be sitting in the same situation we have for decades here. Um, I just would like to have a discussion about that, the putting in it to, to support those federal funded programs that are going to in turn support our needs right but wasn't that federally funded program due to the covid and the destruction of the country due to that going on so these programs are once in a great while when they come down for but when they funds. they do come it's like the arpa funds we had a whole workshop about how mm -hmm. to use all those arpa funds and i thought that's really nice but when they, those opportunities come along to be sure it's important that our federal legislators that we have elected realize it shouldn't be partisan. We need that help and we all should have, we wouldn't have that, that money if the majority voted against it. Uh, and yes, I, I totally agree. And oftentimes because they play party politics so much, the truth doesn't come out that all of us, including the state, the excess money is coming from that, coming from the federal government. I don't know as it needs to be um, a line. I think when we visit Tallahassee and Washington, D.C., we need to voice gratitude. We need to thank them. But to say that, you know, we'll use it if you send it to us, no, because this is supposed to be the asks. 
Um, so I would just make it a point to give thanks to them, even if they didn't vote for it. Uh, you know, thank you that this was passed and it helped our community, helped our region, helped our county, helped our state, and thank you. Uh, I have to give kudos to city manager in the, one of the last um, things, statements that he pushed out, he included all of those partners, gave credit to all of them who helped. And to me, that's vitally important. When you receive from somebody, you give them, give them some gratitude back. So that's my take on it. Mr. McDowell. Um, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think it's more what's in the bill, why did they vote that way, that... It's not just line items in most of those bills, like packages, and there's all these different pork barrel things in there. So not knowing what's in that whole entire package, I can't hold their feet to fire. Um, it, it, it could be said, well, they didn't vote for this emergency relief, but what else was in the bill? So I, I don't know how to get them to communicate better to them, with us. Well, and that was explained to us when we were up in D.C. that one time. They get this great big book. Yeah. They got four hours to read it, and they may not approve it because there's something in that bill that they don't agree with, but the majority of the bill they do, but this was snuck in here, and they just... Yeah, and it could be egregious that was snuck in there. Correct. So that's why... So, so I don't know the full reasons why people vote the way that they do. Um, and yes, I would think that our state legislators at the federal level are looking out for our best interests, but they also have an entire country. They have to look out for the entire country's best interest at that level. Correct. So well, I was also told when I was up there that they looked to see who put the bill through and it's all politics. Yeah. Exactly. Decided to vote yes or no, depending upon what party the, it's, the it's writer was. So yeah, it's. Yeah, there's a lot but, of games up there still. Yeah, there, there is, but we still need to, when we read good from something that has come from there, we need to say thank you. All right, what was your next one? Um, I, I would like to add in, um, along the lines of the disaster recovery, it doesn't have to be its own setting, but um, just add in about FEMA reimbursements. They need to be timely, and I know we took it off the last time. Yeah, we need to add it back on. <laughs> um, and the other thing is to... Debris removal for 90 days. I really think they need to focus on allowing us the 90 days, not 30, not extending it to 60, but at least 90 days for debris removal for reimbursements because we are finding with our own city and what's happening here is here we are almost what, day, we'll call it day 45 post-storm, and we still have a lot of debris to pick up in the next 15 days. It's not going to happen. Um, as people get the debris cleared in front of their house, they're bringing out more yeah. as quickly as they're, they're picking it up. Um, so I, I would like to, to see if we could just say, hey, this is why we're asking for 90. This is based on our own experience. Um, 30 days, I don't know how they even came up with 30 days, but um, those are the two things. And then I'd also like to see us copy the workforce housing that was suggested up until the point of where we start talking about Sadowski funds, because Sadowski funds is state. Anything, you know, it would just be all incentives and, and, and initiatives to support uh, additional housing projects and then end it there for the federal. Okay. Those are my three ideas and suggestions, Mayor. All right. So that FEMA language, you want to reinstate what was there before mm -hmm. about reimbursement? Um, they need to be timely. Well, I actually like putting it under disaster recovery and then listing you want the FEMA to be yeah. um, timely. You want what uh, Commissioner McDowell was, was saying. So I think if you put it under that, and then you can ask for uh, infrastructure um, through the you know stormwater, water basins, whatever, uh, I think it could go better under the federal than even the state for disaster mm -hmm. recovery. I had a question about the, the it, you said it was normally always 30 days. Mm -hmm. How has how it changed to 60? By an extended. Governor. Governor, governor, governor changed Governor, it. I mean. Okay. Governor extended so he can ex it for another 30 days. Okay. 
And uh, right now they're putting out the commercials on TV that are putting people in panic mode because we do have a lot of stuff out there still. And they're saying, we need to have your stuff out, not Northport, but other communities are saying, you need to have your stuff out by the end of the week. Right. And people may not be there yet on trying to shore up their houses or whatever other cases that may be going on. So I agree at least a 90 day, you know, increment to get that taken My care of. My concern was with that is I remember with the 30 days, it was always put out there that was to encourage people to take care of the damage and not, especially when we have part-time people, they would this happened like after Andrew that said, we'll just wait until we come down there. And you have a town that's trying to recover and people are putting it off for months because, and the 30 days was as an incentive to get down here, to get this done so that we can get back to normalcy. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that that was a reason for the 30 day. I just wasn't sure how that was extended past, past well, that. due to the devastation, you know, we we right. got we got walloped. Yeah. And and we're still got stuff out there. Right. Right. But I know we want to see our city put back right. together. And this was at no charge to being covered yeah. by FEMA right. as well, which is different. Now anything after that, mm -hmm. if, if our solid waste goes out there and you have to use your right. bulk pickups, okay. there's a cost in that factor because you get two per year. Now if you need a third one, that's gonna cost right. You. So, but for the first 60 days, it was free of charge and all charges were being covered by FEMA. Right. So, go ahead, Commissioner McGill. Can I ask city manager a question regarding that? Oh, he said no. Oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, then I'll get Chuck down here to ask him. <laughs> um, the 60 days for pickup, is that what the city will get reimbursed for is that first 60 days? Anything on day 61 that's disaster Debris pickup, is that on the city? I believe it is. Well, let's see if I'm right. Chuck is coming. That's here. what I thought too. But I just want clarification. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Chuck. Bad speak. news, Chuck. Go ahead. Public Works Director. <laughs> uh, for the 60 days, it'll be 100% reimbursed. And then beyond that, it incrementally drops. Those drops, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we will. We will find those out. Yeah, I remember seeing um, something like yeah. that as well. I forgot. Yeah, about so it that. doesn't drop immediately to zero. Oh, it will, okay. it will no. incrementally drop, and that's to just maybe 30, 60, 90%. It, okay. Is it possible to get us that information too? Because, I mean, if they're only going to incrementally drop for a week or is it another month, that, that is a huge difference. Sure. It, and it goes further out than that, but we'll get those that information from you because, again, with every storm, it kind of shifts the way they change as as the governor or the federal government decides to give more or less depending okay, on the so severity of the storm. When you say it incrementally drops, so let's say right now we're at 100% FEMA's paying for everything, 100% of disaster uh, debris pickup. So hypothetically, the next increment is 90%, then the city of Northport is picking up that 10% difference cost? Someone beyond FEMA will pick that up, whether it's the city, the state, it, it will not be FEMA at that point. Well, it would really be interesting to see how that works because that might impact our budget and it might impact, you know, our ability of, to Commissioner White's point, hurry up, you need to get your stuff out of here. Because sure. if it's going to be on the taxpayers' back, yeah, hurry up, we need to get this out of here because we don't want the taxpayers to be using up their bulk pickup. But at the same time, we have a budget that we have to keep in in, in check. Well, and plus <laughs> with this debris too, there's an... an an enormous. enormous amount of stuff out there. We're, yes. you're, not only are that, you're talking wear and tear on vehicles, you're exactly. talking gas, you're talking time that are being taken mm -hmm. away from regular duties on top of their duties. So, you know, you're talking big money. It will be, we, we expect to have the vegetative debris through the first pass all the way around within the 60 days. There will also be debris that, as you said, people are bringing back out. Mm -hmm. We'll be picking up in second pass. But the bulk of this, we expect to have up within that 60 days. Interesting. Thank you very much. And, and while I have you here, Chuck, too, just, just a quick question. I noticed that there's a lot of debris in some of the ditches and the canals, which is definitely on city property that got blown in there. Are you guys working on that, too, freeing up those areas? 
We are. We're working. Uh, we have internal staff clearing the retention ditches that we can get into currently. Uh, they're, we're assessing the waterways now with the help of PD and their drones uh, to see what we have in the waterways that we haven't seen yet, and then we'll come up with a plan for that. Uh, yeah, because I know you got your hands full, especially over my my by my neighborhood where that whole you know Holiday Park, a lot of those trailers mm -hmm. were shifted across the road down into ditches mm -hmm. and everything. And you know, God bless you guys. You guys are doing a good job. I just wanted it just for the record that people are hearing that yeah all that stuff is being worked on as well correct we're developing a plan and we're working with our debris management company to uh see if there's any way that they can assist us with that yeah, but keep up the good work i know it's tiring thank you thank you very much yeah, i had a question oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Alex, commissioner white's got a question i know they've been picking up the the uh, yard debris you know the, the the trees and all but have they started with the household mm -hmm. stuff they have uh, they started They started in some of the worst hit areas, so the McKibben area. Uh, as of Saturday, we picked up about 45,000 cubic yards of C&D. So they're still working on the first pass for that because... Working on the first pass for both vegetation and C&D. And vegetation were at about 1. Million, 1. 1.1 million. Okay, but there's areas of the household goods has not been picked up. Correct. Yeah. Okay, and, and but that's still going to fall under the 60 days as of now. We intend until... to get a first pass through within those 60 really? days. Really? Oh, okay. Okay. I got you, but this is a good conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Back to where we were at. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> I think the conversation helps us make a decision as yeah. to what we're doing with this FEMA reimbursement right. and the debris removal for 90 days. So. I, would, I would still leave the FEMA in there for 90 days. Because that, that's a cost factor on, on the government. Okay. Um, and, and, then, and, let, and then let them discuss, you know, what, how much of a disaster, correct. at what level yes. or whatever. But I have no problem requesting a 90-day for... Um, for FEMA assistance. Exactly. In, in a disaster. I mean, that's all I'm saying, up to 90 days. Yeah, well, this is a huge disaster area, so... Yeah. To me, the max you can get out of a huge disaster area would be beneficial. Okay, Commissioner McDowell? Yes? Can no. Oh, yes. Commissioner White? Yes. I'm a yes. I'm a no. I'm a yes. Vice Mayor's a no. I'm a and yes. And you're a yes. Okay. Working with that one. So just to be clear, so we're going to have a disaster recovery subheading on the federal priorities. It's going to have the two FEMA items with bullets under it, right? FEMA reimbursement, 90 days for debris collection. Now, the only thing I would point out is that this is sort of the same issue we had on the state side. We have an infrastructure subheading on the federal, which includes water quality improvements, stormwater management, new I-75 interchange, widening of local roads. Are we just are we going to continue treating that separately from disaster recovery? Just keep that under infrastructure? Yes. Yeah, that would be all infrastructure, because we're look. Aren't we looking at the I seventy five corridor, futuristic on when we're getting ready to build our new interchanges and stuff? Right. So that's not existing. So, I thought we gave direction to have the water quality improvement blurb that we discussed and right. approved on the state mm -hmm. moved also over to the federal. Mm -hmm and also to remove water quality subheading supports coordinated efforts, remove that like we did on the state and also remove that on the federal. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> what do are you we do? gonna do with the workforce housing on the federal? Well, what I have right now is it says supports all initiatives and incentives to support and provide affordable workforce housing programs without the rest of the language. Yes, yeah. yep. no, that, that should be good. Commissioner McDowell? Yes. Yes. Commissioner My myself, yes. Yes. Vice Mayor and yes. Mr. Luke, yes. All good. Is that it? Yep. That's it. Right. Um, are we going to have on the other side the state statistics of the city? I'm not sorry, not state statistics, the local statistics oh, yeah. about Northport on the other side, because those weren't here included with it. So I'm just wanting to make sure we're going to have, we're going to tell them a little bit about Northport and our facts about Northport. 
I think from my recall, we were going to do that, but I think there are a few statistics had to be updated. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to run that down and just get those numbers tightened up, but otherwise we're going to leave it the way it's been right. traditionally. And if you could get me a copy before Wednesday, 5 o'clock, so that I could take it to my meeting on Thursday morning, I would be very grateful. We don't have to print them up nice and pretty and though. fancy. Madison? Yes. All right. She's in your office, too. We're all together. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, actually, Madison's out this week. Will you check with Jason? Okay. Yes. Get your crayons out. Let's see how creative you are. <laughs> all righty. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Moving on. 22-3581, city manager, this is your item. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item is discussion and possible direction regarding the draft of the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 1, general provisions related to the adoption of the ULDC, zoning districts, and the official zoning map, concurrency management, and transfer of development rights. Uh, in the item, we did discuss and share some questions from uh, direction given on the September 6th workshop to share PZAB's questions and general discussion of draft chapters. We do now have Ms. Katie Walner, um, our panel three from our NDS department to go over presentation and then questions and answers. All right, good afternoon. For the record, uh, I'm Katie Wellner, and I'm Planner 3 with the City of Northport. So staff has put together a draft of the revised Chapter 1 for the ULDC update. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the commission members that sent me comments. Really appreciate the feedback. Um, so I'll address the comments and questions at the end of my presentation. Um, chapter 1 is entitled general provisions, and it establishes a lot of the legal framework for the, the rest of the code. I'd like to note that the draft has not been through full legal review, so this is a rough draft, or fairly put together rough draft, but still there might be some tweaks to it over the next few months. Um, so in addition to the changes suggested by PZAB and Commission, there may also be some, some other you know, tweaks as, as we move forward. So in my presentation today, I'm going to review the structure of the code and the contents of Chapter 1. So we will discuss Article 1, Adoption of the ULDC, Article 2, Zoning Districts and the Official Zoning Map, Article 3, Concurrency Management, and Article 4, the Transfer of Development Rights. So my goal with this agenda item is to facilitate a discussion on the content of Chapter 1. I have a lot of time at the end of my presentation for questions. So one significant change in this version of the code is the organization. As we've discussed in my, my last presentation, the code will be divided into five chapters. Each chapter will then be divided into articles, and each article will contain several, several sections. So the section numbers are reflective of the exact location, so the exact chapter, article, section, subsection combination. For example, section 1.4.5 is located in chapter 1, article 4, section 5. Uh, so I've numbered the sections like this for ease of access and communication. It makes it very easy to communicate the exact location of a regulation to anyone that is trying to, to read the code. So with that being said, let's talk about Article 1. Um, adoption of the ULDC. I'm not going to read all of the sections of the code, but I'm going to provide an overview of what each section does um, and which topics it covers. So. Article 1 establishes the ULDC as the document that governs development in the city and provides language on interpretation and enforcement of the code. So Article 1 contains the following sections. We have title and authority, purpose and intent, relationships to the comprehensive plan, applicability and exceptions, terminology, and I'll note that this section directly refers or directs readers to the appendix for the full definition section, but it provides basic terminology of who the ULDC administrator is and, you know, some, some very basic terms, the shall versus may, that's all in that section for terminology, but all of the full definitions will be in the appendix. <clears throat> uh, interpretation and, and severability, vested rights, transitional rules, non-conforming land structures and uses, and violations, remedies, and penalties. So again, this is all of the 
putting it together, the building blocks, the legal basis for the rest of the code. Um, Article 2 is on zoning districts and the official zoning map. Um, basically, it establishes the zoning districts and the maintenance of the zoning map. Article 2 contains the following sections. So we have purpose and intent, establishment of the zoning districts, the official zoning map, interpretation of district boundaries, oh, and interpretation of district boundaries. This article, particularly the proposed new zoning districts, are in flux. We have not put the full new zoning map together. That is something that we will workshop together. Um, so these are the initial thoughts of how the existing zoning designations might translate into what our new zoning designations are going to be. Um, so expect some of that to change. I know that there's a chart in the section that shows like commercial, or the new commercial district could be, you know, three of these other, the existing districts that we have now. Um, those are going to be in flux until we, we actually establish the new map. So once we get all of that established, we can pull it up on GIS and we'll be able to tell exactly where all of those, the existing districts are versus what the new districts will be. So um, the new districts reduce the number of zoning districts in the city from 20 different districts to 14. Uh, so the intent of condensing the districts was to augment what is currently permitted in each, each district without losing any property rights. So, some of these districts, as you've, you guys have seen in the draft, are much more broad than what our current districts are. And again, they'll probably translate into, the existing districts will translate multiple districts into one new zone of <coughs> districts in many, many cases. <coughs> Article 3 is the concurrency management section. So it outlines concurrency requirements um, and contains the following sections. So we have purpose and intent, uh, the concurrency coordinator and annual report. We have general requirements, level of service standards, uh, certificate of concurrency, and proportionate fair share. So most of the concurrency requirements are carryovers from the current code or directly from the comprehensive plan. Um, I have not reached out to the individual departments yet to make sure that their requirements for concurrency are the most up to date. However, now that we have had this meeting, that'll be my next step. I wanna make sure that the requirements in the code are the most up to date and are reflective of what we need our development applications and our, our new development to meet. So um, that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, the last article is the transfer of development rights and it outlines the mechanism to transfer development rights from one property to another. This is especially important for properties with environmental concerns. So the city already has, an or already has established this practice. The new code just clarifies this process a little bit more than what's in the current code. So Article, th article 4 contains the following sections. We have purpose and intent, the legal concept, the sending and receiving zones, establishment and calculation, and procedure for transfer. The sending and receiving zones are delineated in a map in the comprehensive plan, so those already exist. Um, <clears throat> and again, this uh, practice is already in the code, uh, and we've had developers request to use it, but it's a little clunky, for lack of a better term. It's not well defined in the current code, so we're hoping to simplify it and, and make it easier to understand in the new code. Um, so I'd like to note a couple things about this draft before I open it up for questions and before I go over some of the comments and concerns that we received. Um, every article is structured the same way. So each article starts with a purpose and intent, and then it sort of establishes the content of the article as the governing language and then proposes or then provides the details for each of the articles. So everything follows the same structure. The idea is, again, to make it very easy to understand, to make it easy to find information. Um, so I try to keep it consistent. The table numbers all coordinate or coincide with the section number that they're located in. So if you are table 1.2.4, you're in section 1.2.4, which is in article one, section two, or yeah, 
No, yeah. chapter one, article two, section four, whatever it might be. So they all line up, makes it very easy to find. You're, you don't have table two, table of uses that's in chapter 59 and, you know, halfway down somewhere in the section. So it makes it easier to relay information to the public. Um, and then almost all the language in the draft uses active voice instead of passive voice. Again, the code, we're trying to make it as as clear as possible of who is responsible for what. So um, we this was a main concern. We wanted to make sure that everything is in active voice and easy to understand. <clears throat> so again, one of the main goals of this update was to clarify language and to reorganize the document into a readable, intuitive document cons with consistent structure that's easy to understand. And all of this like numbering and structuring should help with that. <clears throat> So this sort of concludes my presentation on the content of, of uh, chapter one. I'd like to address some of the questions and comments from commission that were sent to us, unless you would prefer to ask questions now and I can answer them. Which, which would you prefer? Um, we, got, we got plenty of questions going on up here, so let's do our questions here. And if they happen to cross paths, then Perfect. They, they would be the same ones. So Commissioner Luke. I was kind of hoping for the other so I didn't have to be an idiot and ask a question that was already asked. Uh, first of all, I have to compliment you. What an awesome job you are doing. I wish you were here several, several, several years, years ago. ago. <laughs> uh, but the way you're going through this is, is just phenomenal. It's consistent. It is simple, though I'm going to show how unsimplified I am. Uh, you have proper detail, proper grammar. Just thank you immensely for what you're doing. Can you explain to me um, 1.4.3? That is the sending and receiving zones. Yes. Hold and on, the sending zones, as you just got done stating, deal with conservation type areas, environmentally sensitive or that. And then receiving zone, is that if somebody wants to give up property in that uh, sending zone, they go to a receiving zone? So this all fa falls under the transfer of development rights. Right. So essentially what this allows us to do is if you have a property that falls into a, or into a sending zone, most of them are environmentally um, they have environmental concerns on them. And so you can sell the development rights from that property and apply them to another property. So when you buy a property, you, you acquire a, what's called a bundle of rights. Um, and one of those rights is developing that property. So you can sell that right to somebody else and it can be transferred to what we call receiving zones. And in many cases, I believe all of our receiving zones are in our activity centers. So it helps um, create more density and more development in the receiving zones and essentially moves it away from the sending zones. So what you would do, <coughs> you would sell your development rights on your sending zone property, and then that would be applied to a um, receiving zone property, so like somewhere in the activity center, and there's a conversion rate of if you have <coughs> a um, sending zone property that has a certain density, then that density converts to X density on the receiving zone or the receiving site. So you get a density bonus for, for essentially conserving that other property in perpetuity. That makes sense, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> really, it's, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in that field. Uh, so essentially, so, it moves development I'm, where we want it to be. Right. Well, I'm seeing it's mainly these activity centers and, and things like that that are the receiving zones. Suppose somebody has just a residential lot in one of these environmentally conservative areas and they want to give up or sell their right to build a home on it. Mm -hmm. So 
give me a breakdown of what that would be. So they can't give those rights anywhere else but to those activities centers. So they can sell it to um, someone that would be developing in uh, one of the receiving zones, any of them. And essentially it creates in perpetuity that the original property owner that that's on the environmentally sensitive land, let's say. So they have the, the single family home site. Um, it will create a mechanism will be put on the property to denote that as cannot be developed ever. So it essentially maintains that property in perpetuity as undeveloped to help whatever the environmentally sensitive issue is, whether it's wetlands or it's in the Mayaka River buffer, or whatever it might be. And so they can sell it to a developer that's going to develop in the uh, activity center. And they record the deed saying that the original property can't be developed. And essentially, it just moves that density from one property to the other. So, the, so in other words, whoever they sold it to can build a single family dwelling in the activity center? No, most of the time it's going to, I mean, potentially, but most of the time it's going to be that someone is trying to build multifamily or, you know, uh, some other type of more intense development and they need a couple extra dwelling units per acre or whatever it might be. And so they'll purchase um, properties from the sending zone and apply them in the, the activity center to allow for more density. All right, so it's more along the line of density. Um, boy, am I glad you, you're doing this and not me. <laughs> uh, so you can't, they can't change what goes in that activity center. So when we come up with our... Um, or, uh, you know, what can be built or percentages mm -hmm. or whatever, they can't put something that's not allowed. It's only going to affect the density. Correct. You explained it very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the only other thing that I saw was uh, in 1.2.4, 3 and 4 just repeat each other. They do. I apologize for that. No, nope, that is no problem. You did an excellent job. Thank Vice you. Mayor Langdon. Uh, thank you, sir. I, again, excellent job. This is really terrific. Uh, just one comment on um, the new district zoning sections. I don't see anything for resort. Mm -hmm. Development um, is it assumed somewhere, or should we think about developing some zoning for a resort area? So um, the way that we've had it, well, so the short answer is that a resort would be a commercial use and could be in the commercial district or the mixed use district. So essentially, what we've done is in looking at the potential uses in all of these districts, we've included things like resort. Instead of having a resort-specific district, we'll have districts that will allow things like resorts in them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But the, the uses, the acceptable and unacceptable uses wouldn't be resort-specific. It would be Correct. set. So, you know, I'm thinking more um, along the lines. Well, I mean, I'm thinking of Ortiz Boulevard. We do have in our comprehensive plan at some point working with the county to mm -hmm. annex that area. Mm -hmm. I would not want to see general um, commercial development in that area. I would like much more specific zoning to create a resort-like atmosphere. Um, the closest thing I can think of is what the city of Punta Gorda did after Charlie to zone their downtown area. Mm -hmm. So they, they, for example, did not want a big box store there, which would certainly be allowed under a general commercial area. They wanted to keep a quaint 
kind of resorty feeling in their downtown area. So they had very specific zoning requirements to create that kind of atmosphere. So I'd just like to suggest that we think about that in anticipation of annexing in Ortiz. Uh, and you know we, we have a lot of conversations about warm mineral springs mm -hmm. itself. <clears throat> Um, and so I, I'd like to see sort of more specific guidance to commercial development in that area. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we might be able to, depending on where it's located, whether it's an activity center, if we ex expand the activity centers or potentially village district, there are some ways to work around um, the sort of catch-all zoning districts, whether it's commercial or mixed use or whatever it might be, um, to have more tailored zoning regulations for mm -hmm. the that specific area. Activity area. Mm -hmm. So you would set it at the activity center area? Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, Hello. Lori Barnes, Planning and Zoning Manager. Um, we, we are aware of the commission's vision for War Mineral Springs, um, and we understand that there's a potential need for comprehensive plan amendment regarding War Mineral Springs Activity Center. And when it comes to activity centers, including War Mineral Springs, activity centers currently are a future land use designation. We're proposing each to be its own zoning district okay. in the new yeah. code. Okay. Therefore, we can define resort and we can, with the commission's direction, determine what activity centers uh, should have resorts as a permitted use or mm -hmm. a conditional use, um, as well as your village districts. Okay. okay. That, that would do it. Thank you. That's it for me. Commissioner McDowell. Do you want Commissioner White to go first? Uh, you are up. Doesn't Next. matter. I can have Commissioner White go first. Thank you. I'm just kind of piggybacking over Commissioner Commissioner Lou because I had uh, about the, the sending receiving zone. So this is only, you can only send if it's been already designated as environmentally sensitive land. So it would, would not ever apply to a single family lot sitting somewhere. It might be on a single family lot, but it would have, it would be a single family lot that's already been designated as a sending zone or. Right. Yeah. It would, right. I'm just saying, I think that's probably unlikely that that, that would happen. Not just necessarily. One little lot. The green, the green moves down. Yeah. The what? Well. There are areas that would allow single family that this would apply to. And the density bonus would move the density of, for the single family of the one dwelling unit per acre that it has, however, however many, right. whatever the density is. Oh. And then it would, okay. through the conversion yeah. that was in the code, um, add it to whatever okay. the, the cent or the receiving zone was. Right. So you're talking about the tiers that are there now, the people that haven't <coughs> sold yet. This is a way for them to maybe get rid of that. Okay. Thank you. Now that makes sense. Um, and do we have the mechanism now for this or no? This is something brand new in North Park? We do. Commissioner White, um, Mayor and Commissioners, the, um, to tag on the single family lot issue and whether they could be designated a sending zone, we are looking at those areas in the Mayaka River protection zone and any, any lots that include wetlands um, are scrub jay lots and we intend to incorporate all of those factors into properties that will qualify as a sending zone. Okay. And yes, we do have a mechanism for TDRs right now. It's just very difficult to understand Man. and follow and to calculate the number of dwelling units or the intensity that can be transferred. Um, and moreover, we have conflicts between the ULDC and the comprehensive plan as far as the TDR section is concerned. Okay, and has this ever been done? Has anybody ever transferred uh, their development rights? Here in Northport? Yeah. I, I am not aware of a history. We do have a current application under review in which they are requesting TDRs 
for an environmentally sensitive property um, that actually they are planning to convey to Sarasota County to be um, kept in conservation and perpetuity. Okay. All right, thank we you. We can certainly see if we have a history of it actually being done and let you know at our next update. All right, I, th I think this is great uh, to finally get this done. I, I think some of you are familiar with the Wildflower Preserve up, out in Englewood, because um, I was on the Lemon Bay Conservancy Board when that happened, and that was a result of development rights being being sold away, and, but the developer didn't think he did sell them all, but he did. So. <laughs> That's why that property was able to eventually be acquired because it could not be developed um, for that. Mayor, may I ask a follow-up question to Commissioner White's question? Did you have any more questions? No, that was it. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so would you anticipate that enabling people to sell development rights on house lots that are in sensitive areas would that impact the city's need to buy those lots? Would you anticipate it would push that activity to the private market as opposed to having the city buy up those lots? So the way that it's worded in the code would be that the, the property owner would convey the rights of the, the well, it would convey, convey the rights of the property to the seller or to the buyer of whomever is going to use the density or right. whatever it is on the, the new the other property. Right. For the property itself, it essentially, I don't know whether it's a deed or whether there's some sort of legal mechanism that would convey that property as conservation land. Right. And they would be able to either convey it to the, the city or the county um, to be able to maintain in perpetuity. Uh, I believe our language specified that it, would not be conveyed to the city, that it would be conveyed to the oh, county. So I'm that sorry, we would not I didn't ask that question okay. very clearly. Right now, the city has a program of buying up household lots mm -hmm. along the Mayaka River to prevent development there because of the flooding situations. Would you anticipate by allowing those property owners to generate revenue by selling the development rights that it might uh, lessen our need to purchase those properties. Is that making sense? Yes, it should. It should. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, Mayor. You got her back up again. <laughs> Commissioner okay. McDowell. So if we use the TDRs, it says here in B that in no instance shall the city of Northport be deeded the sending property. Granted. I'm not talking about deeding property to the oh, city. I, that wasn't my question at all. Wasn't my question. Well, I thought I heard her say that that isn't going to happen. And I just. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so currently our current TDR section does talk about properties being deeded to the city. Um, as far as. Continuing that practice, we do not recommend that those properties be deeded to the city because mm -hmm. then the city inherits mm -hmm. the ongoing maintenance responsibility. Even a vacant lot needs to be, um, underbrush needs to be cleared, exotic invasives need to be removed. So our preference and our recommendation is that that property owner who's sending those development rights, they either hold the property in their own ownership and they continue to be responsible for maintenance or they can work with the county to deed it to the county as a conservation property or one of our local environmental nonprofits may be willing to take on that property and handle the ongoing maintenance responsibility. Um, the city public works department frankly has enough to do without maintaining single family vacant lots um, that we've acquired over time. Um, and yes, with the Mayaka, if they can send those development rights and they utilize the program, that's less tax taxpayer dollars the city will be using to purchase those properties. I love it, thank you very much. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, Mayor, um, I'm in a quandary here because I understand this is a workshop and we're supposed to go through questions that we have on the actual document. 
Um, I submitted my document with a lot of questions, a lot of comments, a lot of clarifications. Um, I have not received that back yet. And I sent it out before the hurricane hit and I have not received any type of response. So in my mind, it's like either one, they didn't receive it or two, didn't review it or three, never sent me a response. Right. So I don't know what to do with my questions that I have. One second, because she did state in the beginning that she had questions that she had answers for. Are those those questions? Yes, sir. Okay. So she can reply to your answers now, and that would be your your question and answer period. But I, why wasn't they forwarded back via email? I know that's not on you. I've seen her come up, so... <laughs> For the record, Juliana Bali, Assistant City Manager. Our apologies. Um, the responses were just said this morning to all the questions that were sent okay. to all commissioners. That explains why I didn't receive it because we were in workshop at nine o'clock. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they were just sent out this morning. I discovered it this morning. Well, I don't want to waste everybody's time going through something that's already been answered that I don't need to ask again. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I spent time and energy on this, and there are some valuable points that I'm sure were not answered that do need commission discretion. And I have no way of being able to go through those at this point because I, I didn't even know I had an email. When go ahead, city manager. You just... Hold on one second. We'll get to the bottom of it. City Manager, go ahead. You yeah. get your lights on. Yes, we, we, uh, we obviously apologize for the delay in getting the answers back to you, but it's only right that if you have questions that we answer your questions here so that you don't feel like you didn't have a chance to voice your opinion and get your questions answered. So we don't have a time limit for the answer and question, the answer, the question and answer portion of this. So we're free to answer your questions as she offer to do earlier for the questions you have, Commissioner. Okay, well, I also want to be respectful of my fellow commissioner's time, you know, and going through it. So if you want, I'll go through it page by page with my questions. May, may I make a suggestion? Do you have uh, questions currently right now that you did not forward? No, I sent everything to them. Okay, then I would have her read what the question and, and give the response. But if you had additional, I would think you would need to do that now. But if she's got all the questions and answers, let her do it. It's basically the same thing as me asking the question. <laughs> same difference. I don't care. I just, I, I, I know the volume of my questions, and I can already see the irritation on a couple of my fellow commissioners with having to do this. But this is what we're here for. We're the legislative body. And I, I want to make sure that this is addressed. So we also understand the volume of your questions, which maybe it would be helpful for everyone to hear the volume of your questions if we give you the answers that you are looking for. Okay, so the first one is in section 1.1.1 .1 under A. It says that the... Um, in the Northport Charter, it talks about the ULDC is referenced as the ULDC, and the city of Northport adopts these regulations in accordance with the Florida chapter and the Northport Charter. The ULDC is not mentioned in the charter. Correct. Um, so the statement uh, is adopting the ULDC as legally conforming to the Florida statutes and the local laws. So while the Northport Charter may not mention the ULDC, the ULDC is required to comply with the laws set forth in the charter, um, which is why it's in included there. So it's basically just stating that it'll be compliant with all of the local laws and the state laws. But if the ULDC is not mentioned, I, I don't understand why would we... So the, the charter gives us the power to be able to create the ULDC, and therefore the ULDC has to be compliant with all of the powers within the charter. Okay. Um, and then it says the Northport City Commission hereby approves and adopts the Northport Unified Land Development Code 
and I was suggesting to add in its entirety because we are adopting, and this will bring me to the, the question that I have, we are adopting this entire rewrite as opposed to an amendment. Um, so we're, should we say adopting it in its entirety as opposed to being an amendment? I don't think that that wording is necessary. Um, the ordinance will specify that the ULDC has been repealed and replaced essentially, and that we will be adopting the new ULDC in its entirety. I don't know that it would be required to be written in the code that way. Um, however, when we have legal look through the document, we'll make sure that the wording is consistent with their advice. Do we need to denote that we are repealing the original ordinance that adopted it, or is that what's going to be in the actual ordinance? It should be in the actual ordinance, so I don't think we need to note it in the text. Thank you. Um, in section 1.13a, it says the city commission and local planning agency. Um, our local planning agency is called the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board. Can we put Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, which serves as the local planning agency? So my thought on this was that because we're referring to the Florida statute requirements, we should keep the language consistent with how the statutes uh, refers to the planning agency, which is why we went with local planning agency over PZAB. Theoretically, in, in the future, PZAB may change to a different name. And in order to keep it consistent with state statutes and the Community Development Act, um, I think that it's cleaner to refer to it as local planning agency um, than our specific <laughs> name. Because it's setting up the entity. It's not, I, I don't know that we need to name it as PZAB in this particular instance. OK. Um, number seven. It says here, safety from fire, panic, and other dangers. <laughs> it sounds a little extreme. Um, but then the next sentence is to promote, why not just say to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens and visitors in our city? Why? Um, I think that both language can be uh, beneficial. I would keep this safety, fire, and panic should remain. Um, why? just because it relates to, to flood regulations, fire regulations, all of the other sort of different categories of regulations that may apply. And then we also have the responsibility of maintaining the, the health, safety, welfare of, of the city. So mm -hmm. um, we can do them as two separate lines or we can do them as one line together. Um, but we can defer to, again, the legal review and see which one they, they would prefer as we move forward with this draft. And the next sentence that you said, it's missing. It says here to promote health, to promote health and general welfare. It doesn't say anything about promoting the health and safety and general welfare. That's usually the catch-all phrase, and that's part of the suggested language that I had recommend. I had suggested. You are correct, and that was just a typo. Oh, okay. I, I'm i not understanding why we have safety of fire, panic, and other dangers when promoting the health, safety, and general welfare of the citizens in our city is, is the catch-all. Yeah. I think that some of that language was a carryover from the current code. Yeah, um, which... Right. So... <laughs> Again, I, I would have to defer to whatever the legal advice is as to whether or not we should include the, the safety from fire, panic, and other dangers, as they do impact other types of regulations. Um, and, or we can simplify it to be just the Yeah, the just health, promote safety, the and health, general safety, and general welfare of the citizens and visitors to our city. It, it says it all. I mean, if there's panic, we're promoting general safety. <laughs> I'm not disagreeing with that. Um, the, 
the fire panic and flooding was a carry forward mm -hmm. from the current code and if you look at the provisions in this section they all discuss relationship back to the comprehensive plan now the comprehensive plan does as does the uldc have specific regulations regarding fire safety regarding flood prevention regarding um, hurricane evacuation and you know as in the next several lines protection of natural and scenic resources of the city implement implementation of impact fees so this is really a listing of how these regulations refer back to the comprehensive plan and the provisions therein um, we're happy to include that general language to protect the health safety and welfare of the public but we do think it's important that this listing of the relationship of the comprehensive plan tie back to those provisions that are specifically provided for in the comprehensive plan. So if we go to plain devil's advocate, if we're going to change our comp plan and this gets deleted, now we have it in our ULDC that we just took out of our comp plan. <laughs> We will still have provisions regarding safety from fire, flood, hurricane evacuation zones, no, no, no. etc. I'm talking about the phrase safety from fire, panic, and other dangers. That's what I'm looking to have removed. I'm, I absolutely agree. We need to keep the rest of it. Don't misunderstand me. I'm, And number eight talks about the, the flooding, and number nine talks about the surface waters and ground waters and stuff. Right. It's that first sentence that if we take it out of the comp plan, now it's in our ULDC. Now we got to update our ULDC because now it doesn't match again. I'm hoping that that sentence is going to come out of our comp plan. Well, I don't think that specific sentence exists in our comp plan. Okay, well, then um, we can take it out. We. <laughs> The general intent to protect the public from fire, panic, flooding is in the comp plan. But um, Katie and I will work together to put together some language that hopefully will be uh, more acceptable and cover the general intent as well as any provisions in the comprehensive plan that relate to the ULDC. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I look forward to that conversation at the next go around. Um, number 10, it says um, implementation of impact fees and developer ex exactions. Mm -hmm. What exactly are those? Are those the city giving the developer exactions or is the developer giving the city exactions? What? I actually had to look up that word just to see what the heck it meant. And it wasn't very clear. So. So an exaction is something that the city is requiring from the developer. So this can take on lots of different uh, roles or like different entities, if you will. Um, this can be a lot of different things. So um, this is a pretty commonly used term in the planning and development community. Uh, I think our thought process on this was that, again, we would have to defer to the legal advice to to determine whether or not further clarification is required. But the reality is that it, we're, the implementation of impact fees and developer exactions, the developer exactions would be, you know, anything else that the city is requiring from the developer to do. And that can cover numerous categories. And so it would be the imp impact fees and exactions are the two categories that that, that would cover. And so um, I think that the wording is, I mean, we don't know what those specific exactions are going to be until the project comes forward. So it's better to keep it as just the general exactions than, you know, specify something. So it's the developer exactions to the city. It's not the city giving the developer exactions. Well, That's where I'm looking for the clarity is. So the city is requiring exactions from the developer. Okay, so maybe... So it's a city's required exactions. I'm not trying to wordsmith. I'm just trying to clean it up because it wasn't clear. 
And and I just wanted to make sure that it is clear. Okay. Uh, we will take that into consideration and we'll discuss it <clears throat> with legal counsel. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, under B, uh, section 1.14B, the regulations are applicable within the city's corporate limits and intended to use as an advisory capacity throughout the city planning areas identified in the Northport comp plan. So I have a two-part question. Why is the ULDC advisory capacity? So I think some of this wording, I think, got changed at some point. Um, and I don't, I don't remember where the advisory capacity came from. And I don't know whether it was just a, a you know, change of word that shouldn't have changed to that particular word, like a typo. Um, but it, the intent of this statement was to show that these are advising the city to support compliance with the comprehensive plan and relates to the city's former joint planning area agreement with Sarasota County. Um, but I think that this particular sentence needs to be revised. So it's not an advisory capacity for the whole ULDC. It's an advisory capacity, particularly for like the joint planning areas, which aren't currently part of the, the city, but but may become part of the city. So there's some some other mechanisms at work there, which I think is why it was initially designated as advisory. Um, but we agree that that sentence is unclear. Okay. So, Mayor, do you need <coughs> consensuses for them to change things or look at um, things? No, or? I'd rather have them look into them at themselves as staff. Okay. I don't want this commission to muddy the waters in this process at this point right now. Okay. That's just my opinion. I, I, and that's why I wanted to yeah, ask that's you. That's just my opinion, and I'd much rather have them. They're, they're going to get legal and, and work with staff, so okay. let's leave it at that, please. All right. And the Commissioner letter D. Mattel, if I may. If I may. Um, that, that, particular, that particular sentence should definitely be rewritten. Um, it should be two sentences. The ULDC applies to the munis municipal limits. And the, the, the intent of the advisory capacity is for the city's joint planning area, which, or future joint planning area. Um, cities and counties cooperate with each other. And if a county were to receive an application for development that is in a city's joint planning area, they'll ask for our feedback on that development proposal. And in as much as we were able to provide feedback, we look at our ULDC and say, you know, our regulations are a little bit different than yours county. And since this will eventually be in the city limits, we'd like to see the developer incorporate A, B, C, and D. Okay. So we agree that the language is awkward and we will create two separate um, sentences to address the applicability of each. Excellent. And my second question then is irrelevant since you're already looking at it, but in that section B, it doesn't even talk about joint planning agencies. So that's missing entirely. So yeah, I look forward to seeing what you guys come back with. Um, um, Commissioner McDowell, I just have a question for you on going forward with these questions. Do we have specific questions or do we have questions that involve wordsmithing and trying to change the language because I think we've just settled how we want the languages being looked at going forward with them rewriting stuff. They've already got your input on that and they're going to research it with the attorney. Do you have any specific questions other than how it's written? Okay. And Mayor, again, I'm asking. I, I, I hear what you're saying and this goes back to my initial concern. I did not get the responses. So now I have to go through it line by line to determine, do we need a commission conversation or is it something that staff is going to do? I don't know this because I didn't get the document. No, no, I'm back. trying to give you the opportunity to where you can ask your questions. If it's like, if there's a question like, why is the sky blue or whatnot? But when you're saying, well, it should be written this way, to me, that's a difference in, in the question. Do you understand where I'm getting at? I was offering ideas on a suggestion because of a question. So we can sit here and debate this or. Fair. 
staff should know which questions have been posed that needs the full board review of it. Well, that's what I was getting at. If she's already put in, in what she had questioned on how the writing right. of this was, she already has that, or right. staff already has all of staff that. Staff knows what they need feedback from. That's but why I figured if there was, I wanted to give commissioner the <laughs> opportunity to, if she had any other type of questions that have not have been addressed. But Mayor, at the same time, staff gave feedback that I haven't seen, and maybe their feedback is not going along with what my concern was. I have no way of addressing it then. So what? I'm listening. I'm, I'm, it's hard to explain because I, I understand that all of you are frustrated because I go into this detail. But some of the questions I have require a conversation, require a little bit more clarity. I don't know if what they are responding with answers my initial question. And they may think it answers it perfectly, but I don't know that at this point. <laughs> It's very, it's, it, it's very unfair to all of us that I did not get this ahead of time to go through it and go, oh, answered, 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 answered. Oh, cool. Oh, this one we got to focus on. I, didn't, I don't get that opportunity. Well, is that something that you can do one-on-one? -on -one and But I can't do it one-on-one -on -one because we have to have a conversation on the board if there is something that is more legislative. Well, are there things that we need to have a consensus on? That are more along those lines. <coughs> if I may. Let's just end it because I can oh, tell no, no, nobody wants it. It's ridiculous. Come across this last year when we were going through the ULDC. We did encounter this issue oh. last year when we are a year and a half ago when we were going through the ULDC. And um, what staff at that time did was to sort of separate out what was more wordsmithing and what were comments and questions that were really policy issues, things that we should discuss. And if I got the email back before today, I heard you. Heard I would you have been able to do that. that. You know, the city has <laughs> been in an emergency. I get and it. And they've been doing a lot of other work. I get it. I understand that. I don't, I'm not you're, sure you do. No, I absolutely do. But if staff, I don't know when they responded to the email, if it was last week and they just sent it to me today, or they went, oh, shoot, today's the, the workshop. We got to send this out. I don't know any of that, except for the fact that we are here today doing a workshop on chapter one that I have questions on. And if my fellow commissioners don't want to spend the time going over my questions, then we can adjourn this meeting. I will get with staff, and we will create another workshop to go through the questions that I have that needs all of your input. That's what I was trying to get to at the beginning. All right, well, hold on one second. According to the agenda item, have we had a discussion regarding the draft of the Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 1? No. City Manager? Are you asking me that same question? It's a draft of how the code, she gave a presentation. Yes. yes. This is how the code is going to be presented. Yes. This is how it's going to be put together. That is correct. There was no, nothing about how it was going to be written within those chapters in her presentation. <laughs> that is correct. So this yes. is the draft of what the code is going to be, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so we've done that. You have. But I also think it's very um, good to confirm what the vice mayor just said. We are talking about two different things here. One is writing, one is substance of what was written. Right. What I'm doing is just going through the agenda. I Correct. Wanted to check the boxes. Have we done this? Yes. Have we looked at the general provisions relating to the adoption of the ULDC? Have we accomplished that? Yes. Okay. And uh, the zoning districts and official zoning map, concurrency management and transfer of development rights. That was all within the presentation. Mm -hmm. Now we're on question. Correct. Yes, sir. Not how to write the ULDC, not how to transcribe the ULDC. We're on questions. So how much of this agenda item have we accomplished today? We've done the agenda item. 
Um, I would I would just ask. Oh, hey, director, right? Okay. I just would ask: um, Is there a way for us today now to go over any things of substance versus anything of writing differences? So, good afternoon, good Lynn afternoon. Ray, NDS director. Um, I've I've seen all of the questions that Commissioner McDowell um, presented, and I've seen all of and reviewed all of the responses that were um, provided, and um, I think. From from my perspective, and I, you know, just trying to be very fair to everybody here, I think most of her um, or all of her comments and questions are not really of a legislative nature. They're more of a clarification nature in some in, in a lot of cases to where she just needed and was looking for more clarification on what the language meant. And um, in in many of the cases here, we have agreed with her that it it needs some clarification and uh, we've agreed with some of the comments on the comments that we don't think needs to be changed. We've provided justification as to why. There are there are 63 comments that we'd be happy to go over today, but probably the, the biggest um, comments are some of the things like um, questions about the zoning districts, um, how we're going to set those up. Um, that we can definitely get into further as we bring back the zoning chapter. Um, most of it is, is clarification or asking if there's some conflicts between different sections. Um, my thoughts is that I think staff did a pretty good job in the document of answering the questions, um, and we'd be happy to um, sit down and, and go through each one of these, but... There's, it's hard to pull out any that are really requiring a legislative fix. Do you have any way of telling me how long it took you to answer 63 comments? Ballpark? Probably about four or five hours. Thanks. Excuse me. Are you implying that you don't want me to go through this in detail? Is that what I'm hearing, city manager, with that question you just asked? No, my question was just due to the volume of one person submitted questions that the expert just discussed regarding the, clar the clarity needed versus the legislative input that was requested from the board. So there's no point anymore in us having these workshops, in my opinion, based on that. If we're not going to go through it legislatively <coughs> and make sure that this commission body that is going to be adopting the ULDC has clear understanding and the questions answered, even if it took four or five hours of staff's time. How long did the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board go over this? At least an hour. At least. It's probably about an hour. Go ahead, sir. You yeah. can go ahead, I was, I was merely just trying to point out the difference and definitely not saying that we didn't need to have our workshops, that the difference between clarity that is needed for Commissioner McDowell versus the legislative input that is needed for the execution and the, the way the agenda reads for the discussion for all parties included. All right. Commissioner I, Luke, one second, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate critiquing that goes on to make something better than than what exists. Uh, just getting this today, I haven't had time to go through and see the responses to her questions of clarity. But I trust staff that they say yes, that does need to be clarified. Uh, and if it is a clarification that they agree with and they're going to address that, I'm fine leaving that for them to work out. Um, but if there is something other than clarification, if it's something that really is substance that we need to have a discussion on, I would like to know what that is. But next go round, I'd like to have the responses early enough because there might be a clarification question that I don't see it muddy and I don't want it changed, 
you know, so I might um, debate something at some point. But I trust staff enough that if they say, yeah, that needs to be clarified or there needs to be two sentences to, to clarify this or whatever, uh, they're the experts. And so I, I trust them to do that. Um, I hope next time that we do receive it in a more timely manner so that, you know, I can review and see if I have something that I disagree with. But to go over this, I can't even comprehend while you're going question by question to see whether I agree or disagree, to be frank. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just going over and staff is saying we agree and uh, and then it goes on. So I would rather not debate clarity, leave clarity to the staff, and then next go around have this stuff sooner so that if I do disagree with something, I can argue my point from the dais. All right. You want to say something? I, I can say that we, we do intend to make changes to this document based on um, comments and questions that Commissioner McDowell had. So we, we, don't, we don't need the full commission to tell us to make those changes. We agree that, they're, that many of them do need to be made for, for clarity and for wording. Um, from a legislative standpoint, I think that our responses will, will be helpful. Um, but what we intend to do is we we're going to take the suggestions that Commissioner McDowell made and make revisions to this document and then provide the document back to you so that um, it can be compared against the the um, suggestions that she's made um, so that you can determine whether you, you all believe that we have um, appropriately incorporated those suggestions. Um, so it, it's not a one and done kind of thing. It, it's an ongoing discussion and an ongoing review that you you will have an opportunity and, and I'm sorry that you didn't get those responses earlier they had been intended to go out earlier but um, they with the avalanche of everybody's emails I think they've gotten lost somewhere <laughs> um, but yes we we do plan to get those back to you much earlier um, and you will see this again with Commissioner McDowell's changes in here where we do think they're appropriate and an explanation as to um, if, if we don't believe there are changes that need to be made, um, you'll have, you already have those in your email and um, we'd be more than happy to follow up on those. Right. And my understanding was as we were going through this process, this was months ago, that this was how the process was going to be handled was with, except for today when we had the mess up with the emails because the part with the emails would have been done already when we had our meeting. Right. So you're still taking it into advisement. You're going through that. But that is something that would have been done and not necessarily discussed here. You Right. You, you may not have had all of the changes not in the final document, but you would have a document that shows our responses to all of your comments and, and questions. And then the changes and come if, forward. And if it's already been incorporated, we would note that it's incorporated. If it's not, we would, we would state why it's not. Right. But for staff to spend double the time doing this, I just don't think is warranted. In my opinion. I mean, it's been done. It's, it's been acknowledged. You're making changes. So now we're going to go through it again just and to make sure that that happens? Like I said, normally you would have you would have had the comments and our responses back ahead of time, and that's why we wanted to make a point of letting you know that we're more than happy to go through um, these comments and let you know how we responded, and um, it, it's up to the commission's prerogative on that. All right. You got anything else, City Manager? No, sir, Mr. Mayor. All right. City Clerk, you got any public comment down there? None? Okay. It's 309. We're out of here.